Hey, everybody. Baseball season's arrived, and so is Annie and Elston. <laughs> Here with you, four hours of live local sports talk on San Diego's number one sports station, and your home for Padres baseball, which was proven this morning as we hosted Padres baseball from Seoul, South Korea, and dropped one late and a heartbreaker to the L.A. Dodgers 5-2. to two. Craig Elston here with you. Braden Soprenit, our birthday boy, getting stuff set up on the back end. And Annie Halbrin will be here shortly. She had uh, an appointment this morning that has run a little bit long uh, and caused her to miss the start of the show. Uh, but she does send her regards and says she'll be along presently, uh, if not sooner. So we look forward uh, to having Annie along here with us because naturally it's been a long morning and uh, we don't want it to be a long afternoon. We want this to be your midday hang uh, and to have a very good time with what was, you know, not the worst game in history. Uh, although a game that had a very disappointing and familiar uh, ending when all is said and done. Uh, while Annie's not here, I'd like to say good morning and happy birthday to Braden Soprenant. Good morning, Brayden. Good morning, Craig. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Let me uh, get my way to the, the stage here. There I am. Oh, hey, there hey. Is. what's going on? All right. It's good to see you. It's good to be seen by you. Uh, we talked about this. Like, what are you going to do with your birthday, with the game? So how, how did you handle it this morning? How'd you watch the game? If you watched the game. I, uh, so I had to be up early for football practice anyway. The usual, right. usual Wednesday. Right. Um, so I was like, I'm going to set my alarm for five anyway. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to get up and kind of check the score and, and go from there. So I woke up this morning at five when my alarm went off and usually I'll hit snooze a couple of times, but today I was like, well, well let me flip the Padre game on. And they're up two to one. So I was watching, uh, the game. I went downstairs. My dad, who also coaches at cathedral was, was downstairs and, um, you know, he was about to flip the game on from the beginning. So we watched a little bit on tape delay kind of like sped through and watched what was going on to catch up to, uh, to the time. And then we watched, uh, you know, kind of the tail end of the, uh, we got, 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 got through the eighth inning before we had to leave for practice. But, um, that's how I, I went about it. I woke up to about a hundred text messages <laughs> of two separate group chats that are Padres fans. And I was like, I didn't even want to dive into this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to recap real quick on the box score. I'm going to watch on tape delay real fast and get through it and uh, and see where we were at. But, um, yeah, I, that's a tough it's a tough ball game to be up for at 3 in the morning. Uh, but I was able to watch uh, some some very important pieces there uh, in that ball game, and, and I am all caught up on the game. By pieces, you mean the pieces of Jake Cronenworth's glove. That, yeah, that's... That's that just uh, disassembled spontaneously uh, right when he needed them. I was about ready to MF Jake Cronenworth while watching the game, and then watching the replay, I was like... Are you are you for real? This <laughs> like, is pod raising. <laughs> like, are you serious? A, a whole new meaning to the guy's got a hole in his glove, and it had nothing. It wasn't even his fault. You can't even blame him. I mean, the, he played it perfectly. Went right through his glove. You can't ask for worse luck than that. I didn't know what shirt I was going to wear this morning, but uh, Travis Peterson's Padres Sisyphus had to be the choice after that game. You you wait all year. Braden, you wait all winter to get back to the grand old game of baseball that you love so much. And then you remember that a lot of it is pushing a ball up a hill all day and all night, only to get near the top and have it roll all the way back down to the bottom. And then you just have to do it again. And that's baseball. That's baseball for you. To I, I thought today, last night, if you were in Korea, we're here in San Diego. I thought today, this morning, the Padres played a very good ball game with two critical points where they didn't. And for a good period of time, this looked like, okay, this is the kind of game Mike Schilt game that we're going to win in 2024. We did get him on, get him over and get him in for the first run of the game. Took advantage of an inch and turned it into a run. Everything Mike Schilt's been talking about all spring. Padres did it. Jumped on a wild pitch. Took a productive out. 
Jackson Merrill got the runner over. Xander gets the runner in. Padres looking strong. But what did we talk about yesterday? Annie and I went through the season preview. We talked about team strengths. One of the strengths of this team needs to be, should be, airtight infield defense. A defense that catches everything thrown at it, makes dynamic plays, makes all the routine plays. And it will be when Manny's back at the hot corner. But for one day, it's Tyler Wade. And just after, over at Seven Mile Casino, hanging with all the great folks, tier ones, and all the the fans and supporters of the Padres and 97-3, we were cheering Tyler Wade for his disciplined at bat, for his good solid base running. He goes and he just chunks away a routine out from Teoscar Hernandez to start you Darvish's fourth inning. Just, just palm balls it, gets off kilter, and wings it like eight feet wide of the base for a two base error that turned into a run that turned into a tough inning for you, Darvish tons of pitches wound up taxing him, got him to the end of his rope. And those are the things that can't happen for the Padres until they can find a more consistent offensive posture. They can't drop the good plays. They can't make mistakes. And of course, Cronenworth having his glove suddenly turn into a, a magic hole in it glove like into a meme into a cliche <laughs> how wild is it not only does it pop but like it created the hole and then the ball went through it it was like, ridiculous it's so unfortunate i mean there's nothing and he's all he was all pissed off about it in the post game but there's nothing he could say it's not his fault aside from the fact that he's using a faulty glove is it even the glove manufacturer's fault this could have been his gamer for the last three right. years for a long time, right? I and, mean, that's that's just how it is. Yeah, you know, like me and old reliable heading over to South Korea. <laughs> Gotta make sure that things lace properly. First moment that it's needed. Not only does it split apart, it splits apart, and then the ball goes through the the part that split apart. Not the doesn't deflect and knock down to his feet. It goes right through. Uh, this, my friend, I are you catching it now? Baseball is stupid, and no one should watch. Right. That Kate exhibit a game one, eighth inning Padres could win it. A hole appears in the glove of Jake Cronenworth. <laughs> unbelievable. It's like time bandits. Just whoop hole appears in the glove. Ball goes through the hole. And I, uh, it's I, incredible. I, that was just, I mean, that's just the, uh, that was just the icing on the cake in this game. And again, I I've, I've kind of broken it down a couple of times with, with some friends that are, on overreaction day today with with the scores. But, you know, overall, I thought, you know, he got a good outing out of out of you, Darvish. Obviously, the pitch count was kind of a problem. It's his first outing of the year, so you, you can't be too upset about that. But he ends up uh, doing his job, doesn't give up any earned runs. Uh, I thought offensively, as you mentioned, they played some hard-nosed baseball of getting guys on, getting them over, getting them in. I mean, we haven't seen that out of a Padres team in the last couple of years. That was... You know, very much the way the Diamondbacks had success last year. So it's good that they were playing, you know, hard nosed baseball and trying to find different ways to get base to to score runs, uh, which you like to see as well. You know, Xander Bogart's two for four with an RBI, like that in the in the leadoff spot. You know, Profar contributing to the bottom of the order. Uh, Tyler Wade uh, driving, uh, getting a, a run scored as as well with the with 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 moving some guys over and, and doing his thing. So. Um, all of those very much some positives. I, I would even take positives out of Jackson Merrill's day being 0 for 3. Aside from the pop-up, I mean, you know, two solid contact balls in play. You want to see that guy make contact uh, against Major League Pitching. And as a contact hitter, you know, at least he wasn't overblown by by Dodger pitching, which I don't think was necessarily going to be the case. But, you know, some positives to point out uh, on that end. I thought the pitching staff was good with the exception of one inning. Walks are going to kill you. Padres issued a lot of walks. Padres also not dialed in on the pitch clock today. That was a major that problem. That was a bummer. That was a major problem for Padres pitching. But they Darvish surrendered three walks. Matsui a walk. Peralta two walks. Brito a walk. And Estrada two walks. I mean, you can't be giving away free passes and expect to win baseball games. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine walks issued by Padres pitching to that's, the Dodgers. That's like yeah, a Tuesday night lose. for a college baseball team. And yet they could have won 
the game. Right. A and we're going to need to pull some of these out. Unfortunately, however, for one out of 162, for game one out of 162, just a single event in a, pa in a tapestry that unfolds over six months, this was a 2023 game. We watched this game probably 40 times last year. Man, that's too many. Probably 25 times last year. The Padres take a lead against an opponent, but it could have been more. Have a chance to add to it, but can't get the hit with runners in scoring position. Hold the lead, not to the ninth, but to the seventh or the eighth, and then have the bullpen fail them in that moment, and they don't generate any more offense. And a, a close, low-scoring win turns into a low-scoring loss. And that's what happened today, uh, earlier this morning, when and overseas, tomorrow night or tonight? <laughs> it will I be, guess Wednesday night, right? Well, they're playing on the 21st at 7 o'clock, so it will be tomorrow. Yeah. Technically. Uh <laughs> Uh, hard enough to have been up all night and then to try and figure that part out uh, as well. But I thought there were good things. Hey, there were some positives out of that game, despite them losing five to two for sure. Here's another one for you. Games tied one, one right now. Tyler Wade's thrown it away. Now the unearned run has come in. It's a one, one game. Again, everyone's waiting for the Dodgers to explode and roll, right? Because the Dodgers are supposed to win 140 games this year or something like that. And the Padres come back and they get a walk and they get another walk off of Glass now. Glass now is wobbling with his control. He's tiring. And what does Profar do? He pushes the action. He tries to lay a bunt down to get the runners over to second and third in a 1 1 game. Ball gets tossed away. It's a fielder's choice. Everyone's safe. Bases are loaded with nobody out now for the Padres, but they were getting those runners over. Get them over, get them in is what Mike Schilt has been preaching. And the first two opportunities for the Padres to do that this season, they did that. They got them over. Now, listen, Luis Camposano hits into a 6-4-3. It's not what you want. But at least a run was in at that point. I, I was driving home from Seven Mile at that moment and listening to Jesse and saying, well, look, at least a double play scores a run, and then he hit into a double play. But at least you got that run in. Those are the runs that the Padres left on base all of the first, like until the All-Star break last year, at least. Every time it was bases loaded, nobody out, it would be a pop out, a strikeout, and then a fly out. You know, and they got the run in, even though it was not the way you wanted it. Finding ways to score runs. That's what good baseball teams do. They do it in different ways. They do it by either walking. They do it by grinding out at bats. They do it by, you know, selfless acts, you know, like Profar dropping down a bunt, regardless if he thought he was going to reach on a hit on that or not ended up working out and, and finding different ways to score where the last couple of years, the Padres have been very much, we're trying to put the ball over the fence, major hitting, would value the slug very high, and we are all or nothing San Diego Padres, which doesn't lead to a lot of runs. Now, uh, I agree. I think it's a positive and a negative in that inning. You get guys on base, and you create action, as you will. Uh, you know, you put pressure on the pitchers by having guys have to pitch out of jams. Dodgers got a pitch. You know, they got the ground ball they needed. They got Camposano to hit into a double play. So the positive for the Padres, you're getting guys on base, and you're getting them in a scoring position. I would be more concerned if they weren't able to do that at all uh, this morning, but they were able to do that. And I've heard Tony say that so many times. You're not worried about scoring runs with runners in scoring position. You are worried more so about getting guys in scoring position. It would be a more it would be more of a problem for the Padres if they weren't getting guys in scoring position. So you saw a little bit of uh, of that today, which I, I thought was great. Again, not getting that big hit has been the problem that has eluded the Padres in spring training. It has eluded the Padres in some of these exhibition games. It eluded the Padres all year last year. That obviously needs to be fixed, but there were some bright spots with, with the way that they went about today's game. It's always going to be tough going against the Dodgers. I'm not saying... Everything is all sunshine and rainbows, but I'm also saying it's not all doom and gloom. It's never as good as you think. It's never as bad as you think. It's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much a first game that yeah, we it's, just it's saw. It's just a game of baseball. 
yeah. right? It was a baseball game. Each individual baseball game, when you really take it and you put it in the sifter and you shake it down, you wind up with a pile of nonsense. Like every time. This time it was a glove that had a magic hole in it. You know, it, this time it was a third baseman turning a routine grounder into a palm ball and throwing it away. Yeah, every game, something weird happens. Every game, something kind of out of character happens. You know, Tyler Wade said after the game today, I make that t play a hundred out of a hundred. Tyler, guess what? You play major league baseball. You don't make it a hundred out of a hundred. You think you do, but then you make it 97 out of a hundred. And then three times something weird happens. That's totally out of character for yourself, but is within the string of 162 games, completely normal. Uh, Hey, this is the first time in Annie and Elston history. And you know, Annie will be along shortly that we've had a chance to actually talk about a ball game. So I'm really excited for this until Annie gets here. I'm interested in hearing what some of the folks have to say. We uh, are going to take a break, come back, Talk a little bit about the watch party because uh, I made it out there in the dead of night to Seven Mile Casino last night. And what an incredible scene it was. We'll chat about uh, what I had to see uh, down there, as well as something that I really, really liked about Jackson Merrill's game uh, in Tokyo, in Seoul uh, this morning, earlier this morning. A little bit loopy. I'm on about an hour's sleep. I was going to say, Tokyo. Total? They're playing in Tokyo, too? Uh, dude. They're all over the place. Just That's next week. Mark game. it down. Maybe I should give you uh, the dry erase board for match game early. That's right. Mark it down. Pick out the number of stupid things I say today. <laughs> it'll it'll probably get to 10. I was hot on the poker table, though, I heard. Hey, listen. You know, the good thing about poker is, is poker is, to me, what drinking coffee is to someone else. Like, if I'm sitting playing... I'm, I'm, I'm wide awake. Got the adrenaline going. Like I'm wide awake. I'm completely locked in. Played till three, then was like, oh, okay, time for the game. And then about an hour and a half after that, I was so tired. <laughs> Guy had the post poker crash. I really did. I really did. But let's take a quick timeout. We'll talk about what happened uh, overnight. And we'll also talk about, like I said, something I really liked about Jackson Merrill. As we continue, Annie will be along shortly. Annie and Elston here on your home for Padres Baseball 97.3 The Fan.
1023 on the fan. 1024 now. I'd like to be accurate. Welcome back. Annie and Elston here with you on 97.3 The Fan. Your home for Padres baseball. Padres lose to the Dodgers 5-2. to two, A game they led 2-1 into the eighth inning. <clears throat> Another frustrating loss for the San Diego Padres. Within that, Jackson Merrill goes 0 for 3. That's a good swing, though. But there's something I really, yeah, I really liked the way he approached his at-bats. In particular, the first at-bat, third inning, weight on second base. The second the wild pitch moved him over, you're saying at seven mile, get him over, get him in. Time to show me a productive at-bat. Roller on the right side is perfect. Jackson Merrill did better than that. He timed a fastball pretty well and lined it 106 miles an hour to center field. It had an expected batting average of 560 on that drive. It was flagged down, but it was deep enough to get Wade over to third. Wade eventually gets in to score for one nothing. That was one of three at-bats. Merrill goes 0 for 3. His exit velos, Braden, on those three at-bats were 105-7, 98, and 95-3. I mean, that's those all qualify as hard hit balls. So three at bats, three hard hit balls for Jackson Barrel. Not bad. No, I'll take that for sure. And, you know, the one thing you didn't want to see, you can't judge him off of the first game, either statistically or even just looking at his at bats. But the one thing that you definitely didn't want to see uh, was Jackson Merrill just go get embarrassed at the plate with three punch outs where he, he's just wailing at pitches, which is not what you saw. Uh, I don't think you're going to see too much of that anyway, just because they are, it's contact. It's a, he's a contact hitter and he's going to be able to put the ball in play. And that's, that's already a better uh, sign than Trent Grisham, which I don't want to compare those two the entire season. I just, I'm not going to do it. It's just, <laughs> it's a waste of your time. Uh, and it's not, it's apples and oranges for the type of players that they are. But to have him bat in the ninth spot and put the ball in play, action plays uh, with his speed, I, I like that for the San Diego Padres. And I like his at-bats today, even though he went over 3. And here's the best part about him batting ninth: Regardless if he thinks he has pressure on him to succeed or not, he really doesn't have any pressure on him batting in the ninth spot. He's there to, to fill a hole in center field, yeah. work on his stuff. You know, you're not expecting your nine hole hitter to carry your team. You got a bunch of guys in front of them that need to do that and let him just do his thing and let him let him start every day and do his thing if that's going to be the case, uh, if he's going to be on this team, which obviously he is. So I was I was pleased with his outing, even though he went over three. In that first at bat, he got behind 0 2. He he took two fastball. I think he took one, fouled one. It's 0 2. Uh, I was standing there with uh, my buddies, Derek and Gavin, and just said, here it comes, the first top-shelf actual big league breaking ball that Jackson Merrill's ever going to see. Because 0-2 it was just an absolute guarantee that Tyler Glass now, who has that nasty hook, was going to throw it to a kid fresh up from basically high A-ball. And he did, and he threw it to the back foot of Jackson, and Jackson got a bat to it and fouled it off. And I, that was legitimately impressive to me. I mean, it's it as you have said many times, it's we are early in the journey for Jackson Merrill. But the one thing that they have said about him, you could even see it in game one. Bat to ball skills, they are there. He can get the bat to the ball. And he did it against one of the nastier pitchers around in Tyler Glasnow. So I uh, I you know, I thought Glasnow looked like a classic version of himself. He's to me the right handed Blake Snell in a lot of ways. He's got really good stuff. When you see him put it together, you go, how does anyone ever hit this guy? It's impossible. And then he walks four before you know it. And the pitch count is up and his command goes away. He gets tired as his starts go on. Uh, getting to five innings was probably a good outing for Tyler Glass now. By contrast, you Darvish couldn't get to five innings, but a lot of that had to do with an inning that started with an error and then led into the heart of the Dodgers order. And that's the thing. We talked about this just a little bit during the break because sure. Nine walks is a terrible Not win ideal. condition against the Dodgers, right? If you walk nine Dodgers, you're usually going to lose the game. However, the thing about the Dodgers is they control the zone as a group 
better than any other team in baseball. Even more talented offensive units, you know, Atlanta with more home runs, they don't control the zone the way the L.A. Dodgers do. Every guy is committed to making your starter work, not getting beat on a bad pitch, taking those balls that sail outside, forcing you into the zone. And if you don't give in, they're going to take the walk and they're going to let the next guy get to work and, and put their nose to the grindstone right behind them. They're a tough team to pitch to because you go, well, just then throw strikes. Problem is there's three MVPs at the top of the order. One, two, three. And then you got guys like Smith and Muncie and Teoscar right after them that can all hit homers and all have big swings and lightning in their bat. So it's just a tough lineup to pitch to. They'll probably lead the league in walks this year. Uh, and frankly, I thought Darvish did well in a first outing to limit the damage to one unearned run. There was no way that they could let him, though, go a third time through the order uh, in his first start. Not with the amount of pitches he had thrown either. A um, couple of things on that. Yes, you do have to. I mean, you have to throw strikes against against the Dodgers, even though they had some scary hitters. But to quote Randy Jones, even though it, even the best guys in the team, even if they hit to their average against your strikes, it's they're going to fail seventy percent of the time. Let them fail, uh, but you can't stop a walk. You can't stop a walk. There's nothing you can do to stop a walk, uh, and the Padres got to sure that up a little bit. And granted, a lot of it has to come, as Craig says, it does come with the fact that. The Dodgers are some of the best at grinding out at bats and not swinging at bad pitches and swinging at strikes and making the most of those pitches. But to me, you, you got you can't be giving out a lot of free passes and putting more stress on your pitching staff and yourself to try to get out of bad situations uh, than it would be if you you know throw strikes and let let them get themselves out a little bit. So we'll see what happens in the in the next game, which is at three this morning. That's right. And it will be Musgrove against Yamamoto. Uh, and just real quick, I see Richard in the chat saying, uh, Glass now really isn't like Snell at all because he has a whip around one the last few years. Uh, let's just go to the to the book. Tyler Glass now's career whip is 1.206. And Blake Snell's career whip is 1.235. So actually, it is very similar, isn't it? Within point two of one another. Maybe they are a lot more alike than you might think. I went through Jackson Merrill's at bats on baseball savant. So a lot of fastballs squared a couple of those up. Uh, he did see a slider from Daniel Hudson that he put in play. Um, you know, that was a, a little bit softer of the uh, contact still hit the ball very hard though, but I would imagine you're going to see a, a very heavy pitch mix of fastballs and then you'll start seeing some off speed stuff. He's you mentioned, you got, you got a piece of a couple of these things. We'll see if he can start squaring those up. That'll be the next adjustment he's going to have to make. Last thing before we take a break, just want to say shout out to all the folks who made our watch party at Seven Mile Casino happen from Adam, from Michael, from our promotions team, obviously Ben and Woods anchoring the whole thing. Chris and Scraby turned up. I turned up. I was there pretty early as we had talked about. Turned up, but were you turned up? I was not turned up. I was not turned. You were not turned up on poker highs? I mean, no. Turned? Because I, I mean, you can be turned up and be sober, too. Just okay. Well, I was, up, one, I was wondering up. about that because that's not yes. how I, I was not interpreting that way. Yes. No, no, not, 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 uh, I didn't say you're sloshed. Yeah. No, because I couldn't up. be. I, you have to drive home and that's drive right. the kid, right. you know, when and you do have this show, show. We got work. You know, we got a show at 10 a.m. I can't be drinking at 2 a.m. You know? But you can still have a good time without drinking. Had a great time. Turned up. Craig was turned. Yeah. Woo. I uh, had a great time. Incredible venue. Uh, I can tell you that like many, not all because there's plenty of rooms in San Diego County, but many of the folks who play cards in San Diego have decided to make seven mile their place, you know, and many of the good card room managers and dealers that if you are somebody who plays, you've seen them over the years in various spots, they've decided to make seven mile casino their place of business. It was uh, great. It's very clean. It's very well kept. Patio situation was incredible. And I just can't say enough. You know, I, I'm been a guest on the station a lot more than a host on the station. And I couldn't believe the number of people. And I get it. It is. It's opening day. It's Korea. It's a unique situation. It's something that's not going to happen next year. You know, so it's something to kind of let's dive in. It's an event. That's how I had to sell it to my wife as well. Like, you know, 
they're not going to play games at three in the morning all the time. <laughs> this is something extremely unique that's going to be memorable. Uh, but nonetheless, to see the place completely slammed. The back patio filled to every spot. It, it kind of felt like, I'm sure you remember, Brad, and it's your birthday today. Maybe you'll have a slumber party. Remember when you were a kid, you had a slumber party? <laughs> Sleepovers, right? Yeah. And then you were trying to walk across the living room floor, and it's like you have to tiptoe here and then over there. It's floor like, is lava. <laughs> exactly. It's like a floor is lava. Floor is lava. That's what it was like just getting through the back because everyone was camped with their particular views of particular TVs. And, uh, you know, just unfortunate that the Padres – stream was like so far behind the espn stream which was inside the casino that i'm like set up in a great spot and then i'm watching through a window <laughs> to see the live yeah <laughs> to see the one that's a minute and a half that happens all sometimes right. we do uh we got a, like a tv that can move all over the house and stuff like that so we bring it outside in the summertime watch the game for the pool spa spa drays we call it spa drays but Spadre's TV is delayed from the TV inside. You end up like looking through, as you mentioned, a couple of windows and trying to look a, a look around a person to the inside TV because that one's the the live one and the other one's a little bit delayed. That's that is a uh, that's that's tough for sports fans to deal with. It is, but uh, I, I see someone saying the card folks not too happy about the watch part. It's just unusual to have their place that's normally kind of quiet and and slowed down at three turned into this den of activity. But uh, it was it was a ton of fun. Uh, as we had talked about, you know, strategies, I went with strategy A, which was stay up, you know, just stay up, get through it, get to it. Uh, Seven Mile Casino made that possible. Thank you for that. As such, around the fourth inning, I just felt the energy go to zero. And I'm like, if we want to have a good show, I think I need to go do one of those power naps. I had to go take a nap. And I did, and it was perfect. And here I am. Feel good. You did better Feel than great. the other strategy. Frank Marchese tried to do the other strategy of go to bed at like 7 and wake up at midnight. No, it's bad. He woke up at 10. Oh. <laughs> so he was in a Ooh. jam. <laughs> you Ooh. know what? It was worse. He went to bed at like 6, woke up at 9, and he was in a, he was, he was in a box. Poor Frank. Poor Frank. Yeah, it was... Uh, Great time. Incredible to see everyone. Incredible to see the passion of the 97.3 audience, not only for the Ben and Woods show, but of course for Padres baseball. And it was just great to be with Padres fans, to have our colors on again, to have our tribe back together. And of course it was the nasty Dodgers uh, and, and it was, but it was still fun. It was so much fun to be with everyone. High five and everyone as the first couple runs came around. So if I didn't get the chance to see you and talk to you in person and you were there, uh, know that I was hoping to do so at least in spirit. And thanks to everybody who even stayed through three hours of Ben and Woods uh, to 10 in the morning. Like, well, maybe they went over to the poker table and just chilled for a while. I don't know what they did, but uh, either way, thanks to everyone. Great stuff. Will not be there tomorrow <laughs> because all of this strategy was laid out to make me tired enough at 8.30 or 9 o'clock tonight to be sound asleep, to be in deep sleep by 8.30, 9 o'clock. And then I'll be able to get up for game two. No problem. I'll be back in the COVID cave at our house. Get the laptop fired up. And then you'll be on the game. Then you'll be on old man's sleep schedule. Exactly. <laughs> you'll be on the Chris Ello sleep schedule. And when I get up at 2 30, I right. can't get back to sleep. That's but... what isn't that what Ello said when we were leaving yesterday. He's like, well, I already get up at that time anyway. He literally said that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 old man yells at clothes i'm already gonna be up might as well go down there ella's got a <laughs> a, a personalized city connect yes i have one too oh damn the padres gave us that oh, uh shit. when they launched the city we are influencers craig yeah i like i you know that's the only time i'll pull the influencer card the only downside i like free stuff and i i, I talk about how great the padres were to give us those jerseys but they gave everybody 22 because it was 2022. Right. So it's like, well, you know, Supre who's this guy? I have worn it before, and somebody's like, who the hell's name is on the back of your jersey? And I got a bar. <laughs> I'm like, okay, here we go. That's uh, not Soto. Right. But if I had to pick my my number's 27, always. It's always been like that since high school. So Why? if I could if I could make it 27, it'd be great. Who's who was your 27? Nothing. It was just uh, your number. I huh? wore a different number in Pop Warner every year, and then I liked five. Because as an Arizona Wildcat fan, Antoine Kaysen was a stud at U of A before he, he played for the Chargers uh, as a corner. And I played, you know, DB. So I had five. And then when I got to high school, five wasn't available. Um, I got 28. And then my junior year, um, 
I, so I picked 28 and then my junior year, they didn't have 28. I was assigned 27. I was like, you know what? I think this is going to be, this is going to be my number. And so I rolled with it the rest of the year, my sophomore year, all the way through uh, to now. So anytime I get a Jersey, 27 is on the back always. Okay. All right. So the I wish I could flip the, one of those twos to a seven on my Jersey, but it's a two. It's fine. 22. I'm trying, I'm going to figure it out by the end of the break, the best 27 in baseball history. Mike Trout. Mike Trout. I thought he was he wears 27. He does. That's not why I wear 27, but he does. Okay. <laughs> Matt Kemp in a Padre uniform. <laughs> rough. There's On been that. some rough Padre Ouch. 27s. On that note. But let's anyway, take that a is break. My, what's what's your number there, Craig? Oh, I'm gonna what tell I'm, me at the tease. Sure. Yeah, I'll give you a tease. Yeah. I'll tell you a number. I don't have a number. I'll tell you a number. If you got I a custom jersey? Like what number would you want? 619. That's what I've always been putting on the back when they give me a, a the, soccer's custom. <laughs> the three, the three number six. Yeah, go six one nine. I like it. Like I'm, I'm a Liga Liga Emeki's trial player. <laughs> Got the three digit jersey, <laughs> just running out there, getting in there in the seventy fifth minute. Annie and Elston. I, uh, I really, really like Mike Schilt, and I don't ever want to say bad things, but what the heck was blank doing in there late? We'll fill in that blank. As a tease, we'll play match game at 1245 today. And Andy will be along shortly as well. Andy and Elston here on The Fan.
Listen to Sam Levitt's podcast, Inside San Diego Baseball, where Sam will cover everything going on with the Padres. Find it at 97.3thefansd.com, the Odyssey app, or wherever you get your podcasts. For example, if you missed his postgame show after today's 5-2 loss to the Dodgers in Seoul, South Korea, you could find that on Sam's Inside San Diego Baseball podcast feed. So subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts or check it out on the Odyssey app. Annie and Elston here with you. Annie will be along a little bit later in the show. She's uh, caught up, tied up in some stuff, but she'll be along as soon as she can. We're kind of going through some of the good and the bad of today's game. If Annie's not here in the second hour, we'll probably open up the phone lines a little bit. So we'll give you the opportunity to overreact to everything that's happened with one 162nd of the season complete. It's time to definitely make judgments and reactions. So what I'm about to say, please take it within that vein. This is one of 162. I shouldn't say anything. Overreaction Wednesday. Realistically, and you hate to say it, right? Last year, it was so annoying. 20 games in. Don't worry about it. Nine and 11. Who cares? Don't worry about it. 40 games in, you know, three, four games. It's, it really is though. It is. And and the thing about baseball is again, each game is, is just an event. There's almost no meaning to any one game. Like we go back and look later at the end of the year, we go back and look and go, look, those were five games that really mattered to a team, whether they won or whether they lost. But along the way, many of them just fall into predictable boxes. Quite frankly, the Padres and the Dodgers, as we know, what it, you looked it up, the last time that the Padres beat the Dodgers in the season series was 2010. 2010. That is 14 years ago. 2010. The last time, the and, and it was 10 to 8. Yes, it was close. It was 10 to 8. Like, oh, we really got you that time. 10 to 8. So this is the unfortunate, annoying result that the Dodgers grind their way to in the regular season over and over again. And I got to say, first time wheeling it out in a real game, live fire, seeing Betts followed by Otani and then Freeman, it's just ridiculous. Because Otani just looks like every single time if you put it over the plate, he's going to hit it 600 feet. Or how about the the fact that he beat out that double play today? The first inning. He's so fast. Yeah, that was, when the ball was hit, it's tailor-made up the middle. The turn was good. Everything was crisp by the Padres. And he beat it by like a mile. It wasn't even like a close play. And I thought for sure it was a DP when he put the ball in play. Yeah. Insanity. He's so fast. Stole that base easily. He He goes first to third, second to home, first to home. Uh, he just flies around the base pass. He's truly a great player. There's no getting around it. It's super obnoxious that not only is he a Dodger, but that he did his contract the way he did, and he's just set everything up uh, the way he has. But you got to give him his props. And then you got Freddie Freeman right after that. And then you got got Smith. And then you got the two troglodytes, Muncie and, and Teoscar. The one good thing you know about those two, I don't know how many homers they're going to hit. I don't know how what their average is going to be, those two of them combined at the end of the year, but I know they're going to strike out 375 times between the two of them. Guaranteed. Could be more than that, but I know that those two positions in the lineup will create almost 400 strikeouts for the Dodgers. So that's encouraging if you have good stuff like many of our Padres starters uh, do. But, hey, Mike Schilt was aggressive. He kind of did play it like a playoff game slash a game that actually should be a spring training game and not a real game. He got you Darvish out of there, 17 batters into his outing. He did not let him see Betts Otani Freeman a third time. He played matchups. I think Mike Schilt really likes the one and two out pitching change. Braden. I think he likes that flexibility of bringing in a guy with one or two outs. And if they do the job, you can pull him and not have the three batter rule. I think he likes that because he I like that too. It's very old school. It's kind of a workaround to the rule. Yeah. I mean, and he did it with Cosgrove. He did it with De Los Santos. He did it with Matsui. He did it like until Peralta, uh, 
no one was starting clean inning. Guys were coming in in the middle of innings. He was playing the matchup games. You have to do that to get through L.A. I thought he did it very economically with Cosgrove, De Los Santos, now Matsui. It's a little interested that he went to Peralta again, but Peralta got the big guys the fourth time through the lineup. That's what you and wanted. He looked good doing it, too. He really did. And he had a 2-2 count, the pitch clock violation. Went to a 3-2 yeah, yeah, yeah. and then ball four. And then all of a sudden, then then you then you throw Brito in with guys on base, which I would rather have Brito go in without guys on base. I'm sure like that was the plan. First sign of trouble for Peralta, we're going to Brito. Guy walked them, they go to Brito, and then that's how it played out. I don't mind. I don't mind that. I mean, if you have a guy that's having success, let him go to the next inning, let him go until he runs into trouble, and then bring the next guy in. And these are major league pitchers; they should be able to pitch with some with guys on base and in in tough spots. We'll talk about this more when, when Annie gets in and she'll be in for part of hour number two. We'll go into our Padres deep dive, our first regular season Padres deep dive, which will start with some daily shilp. We'll get to hear something I'm sure you didn't hear because it happened this morning while you were making breakfast, which was uh, Mike Schilt's post game comments after the five, two loss uh, to the Dodgers. Things are getting worked. We'll talk about the 26 person roster that was assembled. I thought the number one, takeaway was classic AJ Preller. He punted every single decision that he had to make on letting someone go or exposing someone to waivers until opening day domestically. He put Avila on the taxi squad. He put mm -hmm. Patino on the injured list. You know, he made every move that he needed to make to protect his arms, including putting Adrian Morahone in the big league bullpen. Not going to use Cease. Put him on the taxi squad. But the problem when you put Adrian Morahone in the big league bullpen is that you tempt the manager to use Adrian Morahone. You have to use him. He's there. And the manager used Adrian Morahone in a spot that I don't like to see Adrian Morahone in, which is late and close and good hitters at the plate. And yes, Gavin Lux was the designated attack. And what Morahone generated is what you wanted. And then Jake Cronenworth's glove sprung a magic hole and the ball went through the hole. Baseball is stupid. No one should watch it. Make Exhibit A. But after that, bang, bang, bang. And the game was, was out of reach. But Betts, Otani come up with the solid hits that take the game and push it to four and to five to and, two. And good thing Otani screwed up on the base pass. Otherwise the inning could still be going hundred percent. So I get it. Morahone's got a hot fastball stuff. Looks great coming out of his hand in the bullpen, all that stuff. And more importantly, he was part of the 2016 class. He's the only chance to redeem that class for AJ Preller. But if you're going to keep him on the team, he needed to come in probably where Cosgrove came in. Early. Right. Uh, and I'd really prefer it not to be in a one run game ever. Like not in games like this. He needs to be mop up guy until uh, so he can get some reps and work it through. Uh, you already said it, but I, I mean, I think we have to reiterate. He did. I mean, he technically he did his job. He got the ground ball DP that he needed. He did. Very unfortunate. And that's where things can really spiral out of control. Cause then he's sitting there going like, what are you kidding me? And then, then it's a mental game and, I don't want to make an excuse for him, but I mean, he, he did his job. He got the ground ball double play. Just somebody from the Dodgers clubhouse walked into the clubhouse, of the Padres and ripped the glove apart and snuck out. Alex in the chat says our bullpen and defense will be our Achilles heel this year. I disagree with that. I disagree as well, Alex. I think the defense not only will be a strength for the Padres, it has to be right. you got, a strength for you the got Padres. four hits. Four one, singles. Of was a, one of them was a bunt single. Yeah, he got four singles. And two runs, and he never added to it. The bullpen will find out. Yesterday, we talked about strengths, weaknesses, and X-factors. I give defense a strength and bullpen X-factor. And it looked like a really good factor until the eighth inning of this morning's game. One hour done. Annie and Elston here chewing on an actual result from halfway across the world. And you'll be joining us at some point in the next two segments. She'll be here in studio. But when we come back, our Padres deep dive, including the Daily Shilt, find out what Mike Schilt had to say after this game right here on 97.3 The Fan.
Back with you, 11 a.m. Feels like the end of the night if you got up early to watch Padres baseball. What an outing. Seven Mile Casino, incredible. Uh, according to our boss, Michael, they counted over 350 people there at the watch party. Padres fans love this team. You love being here on San Diego's number one sports station, talking about the team and Annie and Elston, 11 a.m. It's time for our Padres deep dive. Now I'm Craig Elston. Annie Halbern will be along shortly. Uh, she says she's minutes away. So looking forward to getting all her thoughts on the game from yesterday uh, and everything that she saw her observations uh, of what happened. If you missed it, a five, two win for the Dodgers. The Padres took leads of one, nothing and two, one held two one, into the top of the eighth, surrendered four runs, greatly aided by a tragic glove, not a magic glove, but a tragic glove for Jake Cronenworth, where the webbing came apart as the ball arrived on a double play grounder, and it went literally through his glove. Guy's got a hole in his glove. Yeah. Hey, what do you got, a hole in your glove? Kid looks down. Uh, Yeah. Factually, I do. I do. There is a hole. Like a great big gaping hole. Yes, there's a whole movie. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunate, that's baseball. Baseball is stupid. Dumb things happen all the time. We love the game despite that, and we love it because over the course of 162 crazy dumb things, some good things happen for you along the way as well. But at the end of it all, Mike Schilt, who managed this game aggressively, who lived up to his intentions, everything that he has told us in terms of we're going to try and take the edges that are given to us. We're going to try and be situational. We're going to focus on situational hitting. The Padres went two for five with runners in scoring position. Both times that they got a runner to third with less than one out, they scored that runner. Tremendous. Problem is they had four singles. That was their offensive output outside of walks. They did draw four walks off Tyler Glass now, but then in came the Dodgers bullpen. All guys who can dot the zone and and hit both corners and not walk guys, uh, and that shut down the Padres' offense. Mike Schilt, his post-game comments, it's about three-ish minutes long. Let's all listen to it together. Things turned around for you. Is it more frustrating that the ball goes through Jake's glove? Is it more frustrating the walks that sort of set it up? How do you sort of weigh how that inning um, evolved? A combination of both. I mean, you know, we – um pitch our tail off to get to that point. Um, you know, threw together a lot of at-bats, a lot of deep counts, ran through some guys. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's 2-2 game. That's a double play ball. Goes through as well. You know, we're still tied, maybe still playing. So, um, yeah, didn't go our way. It seemed like up to that point, you guys are doing all the big things to get there. You Darvish gets the strike over the bases loaded. Xander comes up with the hit. Tyler makes a great diving play. Peralta makes a nice play as well. Did you feel like you were in control that game up until that point? Yeah, I felt like we uh, played. It was a good baseball game. A lot of moving parts to it. Um, yeah, Hugh battled, got through, you know, got got through that base load of jam. Goes back out, went with some damage, and, um, you know, got to his pitch count. Again, they threw some good at-bats on him, ran it up a little bit. Um, then the bullpen did a nice job, you know, coming in, Cosgrove. And, you know, we were in that situation where – Clearly in the fourth when our bullpen. So, you know, we used our matchups, used our lefties. Um, De Los Santos was good, you know, in that in between where we couldn't quite extend two guys too far, you know, based on where we're at still in basically a spring training mode. But a lot of good things, um, you know, 2-1 lead. Just couldn't quite get to uh, get to our guy in the ninth. Got a price up front. Mike, what's the challenge um – using that many pitchers and back-to-back -back games and potentially guys not built up like they would be later in the year, um, you know, as you look to tomorrow. Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, you know, listen, we're sitting there going for it. We got a 2-1 lead, you know, take our shot at it. And tomorrow we got Joe and, you know, King can, you know, pitch as well, obviously. So we've got some length right there, and we've got some guys that we do think can come back based on pitch count. I'm not going to push guys, so we'll – you know, take their temperature, obviously, no more. And we still got some guys that didn't throw today, you know, Colick and, um, you know, Suarez. And so we'll, we'll, we'll be back and ready to go. St. bro, Doe. In the moment, did you guys in the dugout have an understanding of what had happened with the gloves? you guys realize at the time? And um, what was just kind of that realization like? You knew something wasn't quite right when it got through Crony's glove. Um, he's so sure-handed. Got a great jump. 
in a great position where he's going to field it and throw, um, you know, good break off the mound. So I felt pretty confident. I was a three, six, one, but, you know, went through his webbing and, you know, the rest is history. Other questions for Mike? I'll go to Juan right here. <clears throat> hey, Mike, sorry, sorry, probably stating the obvious here, but how challenging is it kind of navigating through that Dodgers lineup, um, especially with those three guys at the top? Yeah, you know, we, um, they got a nice lineup. You know, they take good professional at bats, one through nine, and, you know, we got to navigate the top, but, you know, the whole lineup put good at bats together. And um, I thought we did a good job, had the great matchups for the most part where we wanted them. And, you know, they got a nice ball club and they got some guys that clearly are, you know, good at handling the bat. But, you know, we made a lot of good pitches. And even, you know, like I say, Maury Hone comes in. I thought he threw the ball really well. The ball came out really good. You know, all the guys threw the ball pretty well. Um, you know, he gets his double play ball. It doesn't happen. But, you know, they got a nice lineup and we'd navigate it up until the eighth. We just couldn't get to Suarez. Mike Schilt, the Daily Schilt, Seoul, South Korea style, lamenting how things unraveled in the top of the eighth inning against the L.A. Dodgers. A 2-1 lead turns into a 5-2 loss. Annie Halbern joins us in studio now. Craig, are you in? Uh, All right, Craig. We got uh, <laughs> Padres TL right there. That was the uh, Padres feed took over your oh, mic. Okay. Great to see you guys. Sorry I am late. Had a family member having surgery. It ran late. Had to stay with on board until the other family member got there. So all that always happens on opening day. <laughs> the road opening day. How are you guys? We are doing good. Uh, we just spent the hour kind of hashing out the game. Yes. So uh, catch us up on your perspective, please, on what you saw. Well, I thought the game was going maybe the way that they wanted it to go on the Padre side until it wasn't. I thought that it was kind of classic Dodgers and kind of classic Padres, right? You lose the game late. You lose it by a slim margin when you're leading. And then the Dodgers just kind of wear you down. They're able to capitalize on some things that whenever they, they have an opportunity, they capitalize. I thought too many walks there at the end, um, too many uh, call violations things that maybe you can clean up and just help yourself a little bit down the line, especially against a team like the Dodgers. But also I thought, you know, look, you Darvish pitched a good game. You saw some good stuff from, from some of these bullpen guys. I did not really put this on Adrian Morahone, Jake Cronenworth's glove. It just so, oh man, like what a way to start the season. <laughs> I just don't even know what to make of that right now. But um, all in all, yeah, you're going to want to see some more offense. I, I did I did wonder if some of the pitching was due to spring training being shorter. You know, like, was that maybe why some of the guys weren't as sharp as we might normally see them? But um, all in all, I, I thought, hey, kind of, kind of the way that we've seen it go in the past with the end result. Yeah, this really felt like a game I watched a number of times last year, except yes. it wasn't Johnny Brito and Adrian Morahone blowing the game those days it would be, you know, insert Luis Garcia, Nick Martinez, whoever it was. Uh, but those were the games, the seventh, eighth inning. You've got a low scoring, close lead, and you're trying to drag that to what remember they went like almost the whole year without even winning a game, scoring fewer than three runs. Right, right, right. And and I yes, I remember that. And I did appreciate, I mean, early on, right? You had Xander Bogart's driving in that first run of the game. You had Tyler Wade making his way across, and you felt like, okay, you know, Padres got on the board. Dodgers tie it up. Padres get ahead again. I, I felt like they were fighting the way that they needed to. But, um, yeah, just just in the end, I, it was some, some of it was bad luck, but then some of it was just the Dodgers capitalizing where the Padres couldn't capitalize. Some of those walks that the Padres got, I felt like they needed to, to make more of. One thing we've talked about in regards to this offense – you saw, again, always going to say this disclaimer. I think I have to say it like five times per discussion, because if you don't say it five times per discussion, someone jumps in in the middle and thinks you're overreacting to, to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Baseball's each individual game is meaningless. Almost every individual game is meaningless. They only make sense when you put a whole pile of them together and then look at them together and sift through them and figure it out. And the meaningful ones will stand out over time. This game could turn out to be totally meaningless. 
with that disclaimer, you and I were just talking yesterday about some of the weaknesses of the team core weaknesses. One of those being lack of offensive depth and in particular kind of attacking the canard that, well, all that matters is that the big guys perform. Yesterday was a prime example of what happens when one of the big guys performs. Xander Bogart's two hits, RBI, good at bats, looked great. Toddy, 0 for 4. Machado, one walk. It does come around to score. Cronenworth, right in between them, 0 for 4. Kim, 0 for 3. When your top guys aren't getting the hits, if you don't get two right. of the big three hitting at the same time, then you need that bottom of the lineup to come through in order for you to score runs. And on this particular day, it was Louis Camposano's day to have a huge day. He came up with bases loaded, nobody out, and a chance to break a 1-1 game wide open, and he wrapped into a 6-4-3 double play. And yeah, Mm -hmm. I gave him a 2-1 lead, and it's better than striking out or hitting a pop fly because it gave you the lead. But that was the moment. Right there, because Tatis didn't have a moment and Machado didn't have a moment yesterday. Yeah, there were some missed opportunities for sure. And it it does, I mean, absolutely. Like, I'm not like going to sit here on game one, as I'm sure you you are and Braden isn't, and say like, oh no, like the offense is in trouble. But I'm sure even for for these players, you want to get rid of that taste of last year. You just do. And you're not caring last year to this year, but it think of it like any any person. Like, if you feel like you have a weakness in some area, you want to, you want to overcome that. You want to show yourself you have overcome that. So I think that there is a a little bit of just wanting to get that taste out of your mouth. And certainly when that happened with Jake's glove, there was, I'm sure, I I mean, I, I would put money on at least one or two people in that dugout thinking, oh, here we go again. You know, here we go again. Like what's going on, but they've got to shake that. They've got to be able to hit better. They've got to be able to take advantage of some of these opportunities and they can't give stuff up. I mean, you can't have so many pitch clock violations. You can't put, nine guys on base through walks you you know there there's just little things that you need to clean up there that i think you got to give yourself a chance on um i thought i thought mike schilt i thought managing the bullpen i could see what he was doing there i could see where he was going with that i thought that was all fine until it wasn't right but you could second guess that all day you can always second guess the bullpen I thought like silver linings. I thought I love Darvish's emotion when he came off the mound, when he um, had the bases loaded and he got out of it. Like you rarely see Darvish have emotion like that. And you could tell how much that meant to him. I thought that Matsui looked, I I love to see Matsui. Like he he got some awkward swings. I thought, okay, well, there's some promise there for sure. But all in all, yeah, I mean, this was one that that felt like it was in the Padres grasp and then it slipped away. Hey, you got jammed up a couple of times. Very first at bat, there was a strike that was called a ball. Later on a full count pitch, he Mm -hmm. clipped the top of the zone with a curveball, and it was called ball four. So uh, you who did not have his A-plus stuff and who definitely tired the second time through the lineup, uh, Gavin, who was standing next to me in the watch party, was just like, whoa, he's looking shiny. Like You could just see he had the sheen on his forearm. You're like, wow, if he's he's shiny like that in the third, he's not going to make the fifth. Uh, And that was the case. I really did think that Schilt managed in the aggressive, detailed style that he had talked about since he was hired. And it just so happened that in the situation that he was in, it felt like a lot of the relievers came in an inning earlier than you wanted them to. Yeah. And, And instead of having Peralta in the eighth inning to get to Suarez, You had to do a bridge inning with your fifth starter slash, you know, long relief guy in Brito. And when that didn't work, you went to what I would just describe as a low leverage reliever in Adrian Morahone. And if you bring Morahone into tie games again, went through Crony's glove, I get it. Mm -hmm. But then that's bam, Otani, bam. Like those are the spots that Morahone is usually going to give up a little bit of ground. But what are you going to do? Who else was left? In the bullpen at that point, Suarez in the eighth inning of game one, that seems like a bad idea. And I still maintain, as I look at the box score, like, yeah, the hitting, I mean, Glasnow was good. I mean, I thought the pitching not as sharp as maybe we've seen the first week of a season in the past, but I kind of put that on spring training. But they were able to hold their their ground there. I mean, but I'm looking at right here, 0 for 4 for Fernando, right? 0 for 4 for Jake Cronenworth, 0 for 3 for Manny with a walk. like. Mm, yeah, 0 for 3, 
Kim with a walk. So yeah, I mean, you're going to need it. You're need to, going to need to get more out of that against some of these good pitchers that the Dodgers have, but they're going to be good here down the stretch. So um, yeah, <laughs> well, I, I missed your thoughts. Like what was your full on takeaway? Um, Full on takeaway is that the team got him over and got him in, in their first two offensive chances yeah. this year that the thing that they couldn't do last year to save their life, they they went two for two on to start the season. I really liked that. I liked a lot of what I saw from the pitching. And it's like literally what you and I were talking about yesterday. This team to win is going to pitch the ball and they're going to catch the ball. And this morning, I keep saying last night, this morning, they didn't catch the ball. Mm -hmm. Tyler Wade threw one away. Another ball went through Jake Cronenworth's magic, tragic glove. Like, which is silly and stupid. That's not going to happen again this year. Jake promises he's not going to play with a glove with a hole in it. He He's mm -hmm. told us he was not going to do that. So I had a fleeting <laughs> thought to myself on the Tyler Wade era. I had a fleeting thought of like, should they have put ha Sung Kim at third? Let him man third base until Manny comes back. Keep Xander where he is at shortstop, at least until Manny comes back. Keep ha Sung Kim um, crony at second. Oh, sorry. Crony at second. Sorry. Yeah. Hassan Kim at third. Right. And then find a serviceable first baseman and have that person play first base, which is a lot easier to, to find. And sure. do. But then I also thought this is game one. This is game one. And, right. and, and that those are the kind of things that you think in your head. And then I have to say to myself, Annie, hold on, pump the brakes. Like if there's more of that going on, I think that could be something to talk about down the road. But, um, I don't think that, that it's at that point yet. The only other thing, and then what I'd like to do, I think, Annie, uh, because Braden and I hashed it through. Now you and I have kind of hashed it through. Let's allow for an overreaction Wednesday for the folks who've been up since 3 a.m. and you're feeling cranky and you want to vent or somebody who got up fresh and fancy at 8 a.m. but you watched a YouTube video, so now you feel like you're an expert on the game. Uh, whatever side of the spectrum that you're on, uh, we'll be happy to uh, let you come on and react and or overreact, 833-288-0973, uh, 833-288-0973. And yes, GSDP, Brandon Belt could be that first baseman playing first and stretching the defense around, but we haven't done that yet. Hopefully, maybe down the road. Uh, the one other thing I would say from this game that really did disappoint me was the bottom of the eighth. Because you're down 5-2, but you've got your boys. Mm -hmm. This is the time. This is, you know, fourth time through the lineup. Big four, you know, big four at the top. And Xander leads off with a single. And you've got Joe Kelly. Some of the Dodgers relievers, uh, pardon me for being petulant. Some of them annoy me. <laughs> like, some of the Dodgers relievers just annoy me. Ryan Brazier was bad. And then he comes over and he's good. You know, and same thing for Daniel Hudson. Daniel Hudson, we got Daniel Hudson in 2021, right? It was a disaster. He was an absolute disaster. Every time he went out, it was just tire fire. And he goes to LA, boop, he's good. Joe Kelly can't pitch anywhere else in the big leagues, but he puts on Dodger Blue, and all of a sudden, he just lights things up. Right. So I see Bogarts give up a hit or get a hit. Uh, Kelly gives it up. I'm like, we're going to get Joe Kelly in game one. We're going to take this kid out and up steps. Toddy swings, foul ball swings, fly out, slider away. Cronenworth comes up, first pitch, slider swings, fly out. Manny's up, first pitch, sinker, ground out. That's it. It took four pitches to get through Tatis, Cronenworth, and Machado. In the biggest spot of the game. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, the end result might be the same where they are all sitting down at the end of it and the Dodgers win the game, but you do want to see plate appearances at bats that are a little lengthier. Grind, try to grind Joe Kelly down, try to fight through it more, try to get something going. I mean, that's that's where you just feel like we got to dig deeper. And again, it's so hard. I, I know, you know, we, we say it in here, right? You, you can't take any single game. You make one single game so big. Um, but I, I think that, you know, they were, they, they did all right. I mean, the Padres were playing, I felt like the kind of game that they wanted to play up until it unraveled. And that is when, when it unravels, 
you want to see them just punching back, punching back, punching back. And that's what I hope to see from them going forward. Let's take a time out. We'll let you overreact to the Padres and the Dodgers when we come back. 833-288-0973. 833-288-0973. Annie and Elston. 12 o'clock sports fix is at the top of the hour right here on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
1126. Annie and Elston here with you on 97.3 The Fan. Working our way off of a 5-2 loss to the Dodgers. You know, it's weird. And I want to be clear that I am not whining or complaining or saying that it's wrong. But it is weird to get to the box scores this morning, Annie, and to pull up, you know, ESPN and get to baseball scores. And there's spring training game, spring training game, spring training game. Real actual baseball game played in Korea. Major league game counts. Stats count. Spring training game, spring training game, spring training game. <laughs> it, this isn't normal, but it's a unique experience and one that I'm sure the players will care about, even though it's going to look like this weird blip on this season 20 years from now. Right. It, I saw people talking about it on social media that hadn't realized it until now because they don't live in San Diego. They don't cover the Padres or the Dodgers, and they're not thinking about this all spring training. So they're just like national media or whoever podcasters that are like, what is baseball doing? What is Major League Baseball doing? Putting this game on at 3 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 6 a.m. East Coast time. I mean, these were people on the on the East Coast that were complaining. I'm like, stop your complaining. <laughs> we are we are 2:30 a.m. waking up over here to uh, to to check this out. Um, but I, I think it'll be something that obviously they can't change it. So you got to embrace it. You've got to make the most of it. Do what you can with it. It's very odd. No other team is going through this besides the the Padres and the Dodgers. Um, but you play the you play the cards that you're dealt to to take a little phrase from the Seven Mile Casino Party. You play. You got to play the hand that you're dealt. And um, I love so two things. I love hearing and seeing the social media posts about the party that at Seven Mile look like a just a fantastic time. It's so cool that you went, Craig. Um, obviously, I had that surgery and I couldn't make it, but. It, looked like a blast and it's so fun that all those fans showed up and cared enough to show up and wanted to be there so that's that's just a great thing for the station but i loved um unrelated to the game um let me find it here chan ho park when he threw out the first pitch he was wearing like the donna kelsey kind mm -hmm. of jersey it was like half padres yeah, half dodgers yeah, yeah. And I saw Chelsea Janes from um, Na National Media Columnist, and she talked about how he used a glove he retrieved from a museum that he used in his debut 30 years ago. The guy got it from the museum and <laughs> used the same glove that he used in his debut in the majors. Um, so first Korean-born player to make it to the major leagues during a time when this was really unheard of. So really, really cool to see that. That was ungame related but yeah, an interesting for, for a long time there. I was like, oh, the Padres are going to take this one. They're going to, and it's going to be there. They might have a chance to get out of Korea to nothing. Yeah. Oh, I know. And it was good of Chano Park as well to make sure that he took off that jersey as fast as he could, Annie, because uh, you saw when half of it spontaneously combusted, right? I did not see the, that. The, the Dodger side, of course. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. It went into flames. Burst yeah. Into well, flames that's what happens yeah. immediately. So <laughs> good on him for not singeing his shoulder. He got that thing off. Got him. Oh just knocked just like your earphones, off. right? <laughs> Crazy. Uh, acting things out for YouTube. All right. We gave you the opportunity to call in. 833-288-0973. We continue to give you the opportunity to call in. You don't have to overreact, but you're allowed. Sure. It's your chance. Good event. Here's Sam in Del Mar. Sam answered the call. Hi, Sam. Good morning. Welcome to Annie and Elston. How are you today? Sam and Del Mar. Sam the man. He gone. He Sam gone. is not there. Okay. I don't know why it's not working, but mm. he ain't there. Mm. Happy birthday, Brayden. Did we already do that? <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Okay. Just wanted to get we, that We uh, kind of did that. Not okay. really. Well, happy birthday. Kind of, kind of the start when we were kind of <laughs> mixing together here and trying to get in for- This whole uh, part that I missed that I'm trying to bring back now. Right. Well, we're yeah, trying to get- It's lovely. <laughs> Adam out of the seat and us into the seats and right. trying to tap dance with Andy not being here and all that other stuff. Yes, we did say happy birthdays. I appreciate that. Thank all you right. very much. And we, we heard a little bit from Jake Cronenworth. Not much to say about that glove. I mean, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Sam's back. Yeah, Sam's calling back in. All right, let's uh, let's give him a second chance. Sam, second chance is a charm. Welcome to Andy and Elston. Hopefully we get a second chance this morning and we can make up for last night. I debacle. love it. Yes, indeed. Second chances for all of us, please. Yes, yes, yes. I just want to first off and start off by saying 
how good Jackson Merrill held himself, how he looked. I was so impressed with that that type of debut. It, it really gave me a lot of confidence that they made the right decision with him being on the roster and Manning center field. Couldn't agree more. We talked about it a little bit in the first hour, Annie and Sam, but if you look into the Savant stats for the game, Merrill led the team in exit velocity off the bat. He had 95, mm-hmm. 97, and 105 uh, miles an hour off the bat. That was that first at bat off of glass. Now I, I thought he was composed. Uh, I don't think he's going to draw a lot of walks because he knows right now that his number one skill is bat to ball uh, and he's getting the bat to the ball. And if he's going to be Jackson barrel, that is awesome. That's like an automatic nickname that is great and could work perfectly. So I agree with you, Sam. I think the real test is going to be with the glove and over time, but I liked what I saw in game one. And I think that's where it ended for me in terms of positive roster construction choices. Because when you have Eggy Rosario, Graham Pauly, and um, Wade vying for that third base spot, when you have an elite utility player, you have a two other shortstops on the, the field, you're, you're, missing, you're missing the point of roster construction, A.J. Preller. Like, find a first baseman that you can have there that you don't need to rely on defensively so much on unless you have a broken glove other than that Kim should be playing third base I had this whole conversation once the roster was released yesterday prior to the game I was like no we're, we're missing we're missing a true corner cor- we're missing true corner players and it's it's really it's frustrating to to see that and have that kind of bite us in game one great call Sam uh, I, th- I agree with your observations uh in total uh, honestly, and you know, time is going to tell with these guys. We're going to say one game, and then we're going to say, "Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, you're also going to hear me say five games. You're going to hear me say ten games. Like, you know what I mean? Like twenty games. It takes a while. I always think it takes at least forty games for you to start to get a real handle on what kind of team you have, because a oh, team yeah. can can start off thirteen and four and not be a good team. I I think there's plenty to like about this team, but I will say that when I watched it yesterday, I couldn't help but think how much better would this lineup be if Belt was hitting third and if Pham was hitting sixth? Yeah, I felt like it needed another hitter. It really did. Another hitter or two, another veteran guy in there, another, you know, experienced, credentialed guy, I guess, in there. Um, It it also just, I, I I think, like, Yes, it's bad luck. There's no doubt about it. Jake's glove is bad luck. But then at the same time, you got to make your own luck. You got It's just like what you talked about in that ninth inning. You got to make your own luck. You've got to come back. You've got to punch back. And of course, there were good pitchers out there for the Dodgers. But still, they're, they're, that's, I think, going to be the biggest thing to watch with them. It's only game two. It's not a must-win game. We can joke about that, but it's not a must-win game, right? But you'd think that they still want to leave Korea with a win. So you just got to go out there. You got to fight and make it happen. It's must win for one thing. Fan fest vibes. <laughs> fan I fest mean, vibes on the line tomorrow morning. And, you know, I also thought, I guess this is um, for Wade. I, I felt like too, or for um, glass now, sorry. I felt like he was, there was a time, right? He was walking guys. He was kind of losing it a little bit. You could see him lose his command a little bit. He, he wasn't exactly as sharp as he was. And that's also where you've got to just, you got to be able to get them. You got to be able to get to them. And that was the Glasnow. double play. Sorry, I'm yeah. mixing names there. No, but yeah. that was the double play. Right, ball. exactly. That was Campy 643. And mm-hmm. that was, honestly, that was the at-bat of the game. Like, if you if you wanted to pull, like, three at-bats that were the at-bats of the game, it was Lux's ball that gets through Jake's glove, mm-hmm. Camposano's double play, and probably the bet single that follows the, the crazy Lux play right. that takes the game and pushes it out. Uh, as far as it did. So uh, a typical dumb baseball game. Some silly stuff happened along the way. The Padres played hard and played well. You can take away good things. This is one where you'll go back to the clubhouse, and if you're Mike Schilter, you're the coaches, or you're you're, you're going to remind these players of the good things that they did. You're going to be like, this was good, this was good, this was good. Didn't go our way this time. Get him again tomorrow. If you'd like to call in during this break, you can 833-288-0973. We'll continue to take calls up to 12 o'clock. Uh, very briefly, let me set the rest of the show now that we are here and assembled in full form. Because I'm I'm very excited for the second half of the show, 
Annie, I'm fired up for this. Uh, first off, 12 o'clock sports fix presented by Kia of El Cajon uh, coming up at 12 o'clock, including for the first time this year, Annie, Jesse Agler highlights Ooh. in the 12 o'clock sports fix. Now, when we do the baseball report, you can you can toss it to Jesse. Nice. Hear play by play that you can't hear anywhere else Love but it. here. So uh, we're going to have that. That'll be fun. All the sports news that's fit to speak at 12 o'clock. We are playing match game on our silly games today at 1240. We're going to have Matt Scraby and Adam Klug here along with Annie and Braden for our celebrity all-star panel. We'll have two contestants and a chance guaranteed for one of them to qualify for our end of the month grand prize drawing and a two night stay at Fontainebleau, Las Vegas, along with a $150 dinner credit. That'll be at 1240 at one o'clock. Are you aware of what we're doing at one o'clock? I am Annie? not at all aware of what we're doing at one o'clock. We, so we're going to do the most typical sports radio thing in the world, mm. but then we're going to do it in a fun Annie and Elston way. Okay. We are going to fill out on the air collectively an NCAA bracket, but we're not going to pick the teams that we think are going to win. We are going to base it exclusively on what the head coach of each university said was their favorite band or recording artist. Should I, is there something that should have been done previous to this to set this up or? I think it's in your text. I sent you a text of this yesterday, yes. uh -huh. but it is in it. It's in your text. I did not do extra prep for this. So we're just going to go. We like Prince. Bam. They're moving on to the next okay, round. With that their works. Head coach. All right. Yes. Okay, yeah, you didn't you. actually have to fill out a bracket. We're going to do that live. Okay. Like, Where's my music bracket it's that great. I thought I had to fill out? Yeah. <laughs> It'll be extemporaneous. We'll just take care mm -hmm. of that. That'll be at one o'clock. So we'll, we're will we we're practically all baseball till there, but we will have fun with the NCAA tournament Love bracket it. at one o'clock. And of course, ask us anything uh, at one thirty-five to wrap up the show. More of your calls when we come back. 833-288-0973. Annie and Elston. Rolling Tilt 2 and Gwen and Chris right here on San Diego's number one sports station, 97 through the fan.
the Odyssey app. Let's you jump back to the moments you missed on 97.3 The Fan. While you're listening to 97.3 The Fan, you can see what you missed and click to listen on demand. If you missed a guest, a feature, or some crazy thing that happened from earlier, we've got you covered. Download the free Odyssey app. Search 97.3 The Fan. Tap earlier today. You can get started. If you did that, for example, you could go back to the live broadcast of Ben and Woods from... Seven Mile Casino. They were there at quarter to three, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, coffee cups in hand, and then uh, stayed and from seven to ten, did a live show out there on the patio, and a lot of the Padres fans who were there from 3 a.m., and he stuck around all the way till 9, 10 a.m. Uh, to hang out with 97.3 today. That's really, really cool. I love that. I love that so many fans got up they had to have got you know been up by like 2 a.m 2 30 to make it down there by three it looked like it was already packed pretty early so maybe they were like you they came in overnight they just kept the party going <laughs> from the wee hours of, of yesterday but um I, I love that it was a su successful watch party because you know you really don't know how that's going to go 3 a.m not really sure but a lot of passionate fans out there yeah i think uh in fact uh there was a guy there that has uh, written in, uh, called into the show before uh, talking about uh, English Premier League teams with us and asking if I had an EPL team. And he was there at the watch party and was like, hey, I'm the guy who you know called you about West Ham. And then we're sitting there watching. And it was kind of like this realization. You look around, you go like, it's quarter to four. We're all together, not in a, a British pub, but we're all together in this you know communal place <laughs> uh, of of viewing and then you listen to the game and it's singing and it's chanting and it's drums and it it really did it sounded like european soccer it was like we, we've mit, we've mixed these fan experiences of watching baseball and getting up at three in the morning to get yeah. together at a pub and watch a european soccer match i was also interested in just speaking of the the drums and all that um there was a, a reporter who mentioned that they had been to a number of kbo games and you know how we have been talking about this? The music, the drums, everything we saw in the exhibition games was absent for this game. It was actually a very quiet game. They didn't have walk-up songs. They didn't have the chants going like they did in the exhibition games. So he was mentioning how weird it was because it, you're used to, obviously, in Korea, the all the sensory things happening. And because it was like MLB's version in Korea and it wasn't an actual KBO game, mm. they just kind of didn't bridge that gap, I guess. And I thought that was really I mean, really I was still hearing the bang, 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 Were bang, you? big bang, 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 like okay. fade in the background. I, I don't think it was without chant. Good. That's good. Because it yeah. would be, yeah, you, you'd hope there was something. Yeah, happening. they did a whole <laughs> thing on the ESPN broadcast of creating their own cheerleader chant for Carl Ravitch. And, oh, good. And doing a whole song, a Carl Ravitch song. So, All right. uh, which will never be performed again. But right, yeah. One, one time only. I uh, hope you were there for the live performance. Now, do you go back tomorrow to, to Seven Mile? No. Okay. No. Okay. I mean, if not that I won, wouldn't. I mean, yes. yeah. just keep won, it going. Absolutely. You guys should have had like a 48, 72 hours at Seven Mile Casino. Ben and Woods, just keep it going. Right. If they hadn't kicked the lead, <laughs> if, if Jake Cronenworth had turned Woods a beautiful 363 right double play. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, there's give and take, though. They only have a three-hour show tomorrow, thanks to the timing of everything in Sammy's postgame show. Nice. So, you know, hey, they're not they're not mad at. 3 a.m. Yeah. games. They're not that mad at 3 a.m. games. You know, honestly, there was a weird part of it where I was like, it was nice to kind of get up, have a baseball game in the morning, and then be able to talk about it for the rest of the day. I felt like you got kind of got it out of the way, like you had your morning entertainment, uh -huh. had your cup of coffee and your baseball game. I didn't mind it, to be honest. I mean, I could just handle Wordle for my morning entertainment instead of <laughs> Dodgers beating us. <laughs> Those go down a little bit better at night because you could like drink. Yeah. <laughs> Dodgers. Uh, we've got a couple folks on the line here. We invited your calls this hour, 833 288 0973. Let's head out East County Way to Flynn Springs and welcome in George. Welcome, George, hey. to Andy and Elston. How y'all doing this morning? Doing good, mate. How are you? It, hey, I, first, before I forget this, I want to give a shout out to you guys. You're great at what you do. And Annie, the other day, you know, you're all on your own the other day and you held it, man. I'm telling you, my wife was sitting with me and we were listening to you. And she says, wow, she's really good. And I go, yeah, she's great at what she does. So 
just want to let you know that. But about the game, you know, there's one situation in there where they brought in, and I can't remember which pitcher it was. He was 0-2, and, and we are still ahead. Um, and this drives me nuts. It happens every year at the Padres. 0-2, you got two pitches still to waste, you know, to go 2-2. Two and two. This, I played ball my whole life. I played for some great coaches. And, uh, you know, he throws the ball right down the middle and bam, you know, it's tied up. And I can't remember who it was because he kept changing the pitchers. But I thought Schilt did an awesome job. And I love small ball, you know, especially when you don't have a bunch of guys that are hitting a lot of home runs in your lineup. And from what we have as a team, it looks to me like he's going to utilize everybody that he has off that bench because he's only got what he's got. And they've got the pitching, but they're going to have to cut down that mate. You know, Morehand, I don't think he's going to be at the team. So what do you guys think about that? Thank you for the kind words and for the call. Absolutely, George. And, Thanks, uh, you George. know, look, it's one game. I did talk about Morahone. I'm just – Morahone is a project for A.J. Preller. He's been a project for A.J. Preller since 2016, and it, I feel like A.J. can't quit him. And I get it. He, he's lefty, and he throws 97 sometimes. So I get why you can't quit him. But the problem about having him on your roster is you wind up using him in spots that you regret. So this is a la Luis Garcia last year where people would get mad that Bob Melvin would use him. Well, you got it again. You play, you play the hands that you're dealt or you play the cards that you're dealt. Like he's in, he's there. You've got to use him. You've got to see what you have. And sometimes, sometimes managers will throw you into that and be like, we want to get this guy working because we know that that great stuff is going to be coming out. And so we got to get him, we got to get him to that right spot and, and sink or swim, right? Like you, 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 you know they have it. And so you're like, <laughs> you just, it, it's against the Dodgers. It's game one, but you got to see what you have. You have to see what you're working with. You have to see what you, ha- and, and you have to start earning that trust from those guys. So I agree with you on that. I think that you can hold on to some of these guys and want, you're so badly know that they've got the stuff and that they can be so dynamic in these moments and you're just, mm. but it's, it's not, it's not happening. Right. And so when do you quit that? That is really AJ Preller's job, isn't it? When are you going to quit? When do you quit a guy? When do you hold on to him thinking it's just right there? Morahone has been here quite a while. He's also worked through quite a few injuries. I would think that that leash is not that long. At the same time, he did what he was supposed to do. He got the ground ball. He got, he got the double play. I mean, he, if it hadn't gone through Jake's glove, would have been a different story. Biffs and butts and candy and nuts, right? Baseball's stupid. Thing is, as Braden's uh, USD Terreros t-shirt says, so what? You mm-hmm. gave, The ball went through the glove. Well, so what? What are you going to do with the next pitch? Yeah. It was a hit to Betts, and then it was a hit to Otani, and that put the game a little bit out of reach. Uh, one more call before we get to the top of the hour. Fred in San Diego. Hi, Fred. Welcome to Annie and Elston. Good morning, you two. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I love the show. Um, I'm a bit mystified by Cronenworth. Um, and don't get me wrong. I love the guy. Uh, he comes out of Michigan, which is my favorite school and college. And his first year or two, he was hot as anyone could be. And then they moved him to first base, and he just doesn't seem right over there. And as it relates to this glove, uh, the webbing or whatever breaking. I mean, even little leaguers look at their gloves before they go out on the field and they'll, they'll either tie them or the Padres have an equipment manager in the dugout to manage and they could fix these things. So I don't think there's really an excuse there for him. And uh, I'm just wondering what the Padres are going to do. Maybe they should make him like a designated hitter and get somebody that can play the the position defensively. But I, I'm not really comfortable with him being over at first. And he's not playing the way he did when he was at second. So I don't know what to do with that. Fred, I, I will offer a humble suggestion, which is be cool and watch him there next game. Because that was literally a play. And trust me when I tell you that the major league first baseman didn't forget to check his glove. Okay? Like a little leaguer. And and it's not really fair from a phone call to say, well, little leaguers check their glove. Why did the ball go through? He must not have checked his glove. Dumb things happen all the time in life. 
and these guys are playing half a world away in live fire and a ball went through the where the webbing is supposed to be on the glove it's a fluke it's a mistake and a further mistake i think annie would be to assign any blame to jake cronenworth for that yeah you gotta you gotta give jake jacob more chances here this is jake jake feels terrible and it's and he really even shouldn't because there's just i don't think that there's a way to i don't know how do you check do you look I don't know that you can tell until it happens, until the ball literally goes through that webbing. I mean, I'm sure he punches his glove like, right. like every other infielder or outfielder. They punch it, they check it, but nothing. There was nothing that looked weird to Jake. It was the eighth he inning, yeah. so he had been using exactly. the glove for eight innings. He had been putting a ball in it in between innings for eight innings. Like putting any blame on anything is ridiculous. Right. There. Base. And, I, I will tell you for the fiftieth time, baseball is stupid. That's the point. Baseball is stupid. We love it. That's why no one should watch. That's why we should laugh at these things and not get mad at these things. Yeah, yeah. This isn't, this is, this was bad luck, but it's on the Padres to make their own luck afterwards. Have to fight back from that. All right. We're going to switch things up a little bit. When we come back, 12 o'clock sports fix. Sure. You'll hear a Jesse Agler highlight. But we'll give you all the other information. And he's got the latest baseball news. Braden's got the scores from the first four. I've got arena. Goals are playing right now, literally right now. We'll have a live in progress score and much more as we continue with our number three of Annie and Elston on the fan.
All right, we are past 12 o'clock. Time to put that pesky Dodger game a little bit in the rearview mirror. We got another game to work our way toward tomorrow morning and plenty more in the world of sports to chat about. It's hour number three of Annie and Elston, your new midday hang here on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Annie Heilbrunn is here, Braden Soprano as well. My name is Craig Elston. Thanks so much for making us part of your lunch hour. Let's get you caught up to date on everything that's going on. Local, regional, national, all the news that's fit to speak here on Annie and Elston, getting you caught up on the world of sports. All right, one last time. Let's start things with Annie, with baseball, with the Sky Dome, and with the game that was. All right, early this morning, the Padres and Dodgers got the 2024 season started in Seoul, South Korea. Padres took a 2-1 lead into the top of the eighth. Kiki Hernandez hit a sack fly to tie the game at two. And then Gavin Lux batted with two runners on, and then this happened. Lux 0 for 3, flew out to deep left his last time. Swings to the first pitch, grounds into the right side. Cronenworth as it go off the glove into right field. Hernandez rounding third on his way. He will score. And for the first time tonight, the Dodgers lead. It's 3-2. to two. That's just bad luck for Cronenworth. This ball actually goes through his glove. He's off walking off the field right now to get a new glove. Great to hear Jesse and Tony. Bad luck indeed. The Padres lost to the Dodgers 5-2. to two. They will play the Dodgers again tomorrow at 3 a.m. with Joe Musgrove on the mound for the San Diego and Yoshinobu Yamamoto for Los Angeles. Reds infielder Matt McLean was scratched from the lineup Monday due to some discomfort in his left shoulder. They are doing an MRI with the status is currently unknown on that. Red starter Brandon Williamson will begin the season on the 15-day injured list, manager David Bell said today. The left-hander departed his spring training start over the weekend with shoulder soreness. And the Mets will open the season with righty Tyler McGill as their fifth starter. And that is that for MLB. Over to Braden, who's got the NCAA Tournament First Four action. Yes, I do. Woo! It's March. It's March. Great time, March. as always. Great time. You know, it wasn't a great time. The game last night, the Virginia Cavaliers were not a great time. <laughs> They got ran out of the building last night and showed everybody why they didn't deserve to be in the NCAA tournament as Colorado State beats Virginia 67-42. to Virginia had 14 points in the first half. They didn't score for 50 minutes of real time in the first half. It took wow. them forever to score points. At least they had 14, I guess, in the first half. With the win, Colorado <laughs> State will advance to the Midwest region. And they earned Mountain West Conference $10 million. So good for Colorado Boom. State to mm. tee off cash money. on the terrible decision by the committee to put Virginia in over St. John's. I'm sure Rick Pitino is just so fired up after last night watching Virginia get run out of the building. Uh, battle of two 16 seeds. Winner will play North Carolina in the West region. Wagner beats Howard 71-68. They win by three. Wagner advances. They will be... Taking on North Carolina tomorrow in the first round of the NCAA tournament. As for tonight, or 3.40 in the afternoon, you got Grambling taking on Montana State. Two conference winners, Montana State 17-17, and 17, and favored by 4.5 over Grambling, who's 20-14. and 14. Winner of that game will advance to take on Purdue in the Midwest region. Colorado, Boise State in the South region. We'll play tonight at 6-10. That should be a pretty good basketball game between a team that got hosed in Boise State. We didn't really spend too much time on that, Annie, on Monday, but Boise mm-hmm. State got wrecked with their their seeding. They could go on a little bit of a run here. Colorado, really good basketball team. Needed a little bit late stretch to make the NCAA tournament. They're actually a three-and-a-half-point favorite over Boise State. That will be at 6-10. Both those games will be on true TV, and that's the uh, latest with college basketball. I'll be back with college baseball 
and high school baseball in just a little bit. But first, here's Craig. But first, I've got your arena report. Local arena, NBA, and NHL. The San Diego Gulls, believe it or not, are in action right now. Must be a school day game at SAP Center for the Gulls and the San Jose Barracuda. It's the 8th and 10th place teams in the Pacific doing battle, and the game is just as close as you might expect for two teams at the bottom of the barrel. It is four to four after two periods at SAP Center. I remember going to do Gulls games at Barracuda, Annie, and SAP Center, same place that the Sharks play. So Mm. you get like 150 fans there's probably a Sharks game tonight, you know, and like 150 fans will show up in the morning to watch the triple A team play (laughs) in this gigantic cavernous arena where they've still got all the music up at the same level as if they had 17,000 people, like they would be there later that night. Tough scene for the Barracuda. Yes. Tough to be a minor league team in the same town as the major league team in the same arena as the major (laughs) league team. It's kind of like, do I want to see the Barracuda or can I go to the better Take your lumps. It's rough. 4-4, 20 minutes left to decide that one for our beloved goals. Last night in the NBA, the Denver Nuggets held off the Minnesota Timberwolves 115-112. They move a game clear of the T-Wolves, a game clear of the T-Wolves for second place in the West. Houston won their sixth in a row. Look out for the Rockets. Now two and a half games behind Golden State for the final play-in spot. Eight games in the association tonight. Bucks are at the Celtics. Giannis Attentacumpo expected to miss that one with a hamstring strain. Clippers are at the Blazers. Golden State will host Memphis. In the NHL, sad news, former Colorado enforcer Chris Simon has passed away at the age of 52. If you remember back to those 90s teams, Stanley Cup winners, Simon with the long hair, one of the guys that would drop the gloves. His family is blaming his death on CTE. No further Mm -hmm. medical details have been released as of yet. Just passed away yesterday. Last Uh night on the ice, the Kings thump the Blackhawks 6-2. to L.A. remaining in the playoff bracket in seventh place. The Wild shut out the Ducks 4-0 at Honda Center. Just three games tonight. Wild at the Kings, Coyotes at Stars, and Toronto at Washington. Back to Braden now. Get some baseball action for you. Yes, there was other baseball games being played that were not Major League Baseball games that count in the standings or spring training games. No, there were some college games Last night, only one that affects one of our local teams, the San Diego Toreros knocked off Cal State Fullerton last night, seven to two. Good overall performance for the boys up there at Fullerton. Had a good outing out of Ivan Romero, who got the win yesterday, two and a third innings pitched of shutout baseball. He had two strikeouts as well. As for the overall box score, a lot of offensive prowess for the Toreros. Had a couple of home runs. Jacob Christian hit a home run. Ariel Armas also hit one. Decrecio, Costello, Christian, and Armas all driving in runs as the Toreros beat the Titans 7-2. to two. They'll be action this in action this weekend against St. Mary's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to start West Coast Conference play. UC San Diego will continue. They did not have a game last night, but they will continue Big West Conference play after taking two out of three from Fullerton over last weekend. They will play UC Davis up in Davis, California this weekend. As for the Aztecs, four games in Hawaii to continue Mountain West Conference play in college baseball. As for high school baseball, we had some games yesterday throughout San Diego County on March 19th. Some of the most notable scores for you yesterday. Madison all over Valhalla, 13-1. to RBV over SDA, 7-0. Canyon Crest beats Fallbrook, 6-5. Hilltop over the Cavers of San Diego, 3-1. Maranatha Christian outlasts Vista, 5-4. Canyon Hills over Castle Park, 8-1. Bishops beats Ramona, 6-0. Mount Miguel shuts out Hoover, 11-0. And Southwest El Centro beats Imperial, 6-3, out in the Imperial County. That is the latest on high school baseball scores. Not too many games yesterday. We'll have some today that we'll talk about tomorrow as we got a lot of ranked teams playing this afternoon in high school baseball in San Diego. And that'll do it for me. And And as well for the 12 o'clock sports fix, the midweek 12 o'clock sports fix usually slots in at about nine minutes. And that's what we did today. Very nice. About nine minutes. So we're the today's opening day. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because it's not really. So many weird things about today. Like waking up to a Padres game already being on and it being dark outside. That was super weird. Uh, Other weird thing was driving to football practice that starts at 6 a.m. Listening to uh, Jesse and Tony call a live Padre game was super weird. Um, you know, like being, being like, I can't believe what, what are we doing? Like breaking it down as we drive in the morning, not like some early morning show that you're used to listening to, or even been in woods right at that hour. So, so many odd things waking up, going downstairs, flipping on ESPN. It's like, Oh, look, there's the Padres wild and the game counting. Yes. You know? Yeah. <sighs> if we had won, I'd be psyched about it. It's always tomorrow. Right. Very early tomorrow. Three hours into tomorrow. I mean, we all said split, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, I think they split. If they split, great. And then they don't have to worry about game one anymore. If they get swept, eh, it's not the end of the world. If they get swept to get their ass kicked tomorrow morning, then we're in. Yeah, it's kind of a sexy split if you split this way and and Musgrove beats Yamamoto. Oh, yeah. Then it, it kind of worked out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. they got to win, but we beat your new toy. Like we took your new toy out so much money. Yeah. We took your new Mm -hmm. toy out. We rattled it. Mm -hmm. We threw it on the curb a little bit. You know, I'd love to see that. And then you, and then you get on a plane and (laughs) you know, see whatever it is, 14, 15, however many hours that is that flight back, 16 hours back. Yeah. I mean, you just, you just take that with you. You take the win with you. You get to kind of feed on that because because you don't play another regular season game until a week from tomorrow. Right. Got to sit on that. Well, that's saying, right. The, the, you got to have a happy flight. Most of their their longest flights, like five hours, if they're right. flying back from New York, 16-hour unhappy flight sounds miserable. Sounds like a very not happy flight. Yeah, no, that is very much and not then, happy. And then, meanwhile, the same guy is passing out the tart cherry juice and, and yeah. the gummies mm. and whatnot. And they're like, just get that crap just, away just from me, man. Give us the good stuff. All right. Uh, yeah, precisely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> crack, Come by with that, that beverage cart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's call it a day. All right. <laughs> A couple of those mini bottles might just go absolutely fine. Um, you know, the one other thing we talked about it a little bit at 10, Annie. <sighs> I've watched all the reports. I've seen the stuff at Camelback Ranch. I know that Shohei Otani's an L.A. Dodger. Mm-hmm. But to see him in the lineup, to actually see him in a real game yeah. in the lineup, two hits, RBI, stolen base, flying around the base paths, he looks so dangerous up there. He looks so composed at the plate. It just feels like if you throw him a fastball and you put it in the zone, it's going to be in the upper deck. And there's, and, and it's why, he, yeah. but then he has the coverage when you throw that fastball outside to slap it to left field and not just slap it to line it into left field and to drive the ball. I feel, I, I felt something over the course of the morning, which was that gnawing, realization like i've thought every negative thought i could of uh, to try and cope yeah. <laughs> with the fact that Shohei otani is a dodger oh second tommy john surgery is he ever going to be as good a pitcher again he's 30 years old things could fall apart 20 year deal da, 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 da. doggone it doggone he, it putting him in the middle of those two guys yeah he um what i thought about him a little bit was um and he got that that first hit was in the third off you okay um first of all credit to silencing these guys for i mean at least a good while to silencing the dodgers i mean i saw with runners in scoring position they left quite a few guys on base to start the game i mean the padres did a good job you darvish did a good job keeping them which he usually does keeping them in check um but with with shohei otani what occurred to me toward the end of the game was kind of that feeling of, oh, this guy is just getting comfortable. And what I mean by that is just kind of, he's in a Dodgers uniform now. He's getting his feet under him. He's getting back from that surgery that he had. And he's on a team where they're competing. It, it Not that he never did, you know, he obviously competed with the Angels, but this is different. They were never going to win anything. Right. Everything gets ratcheted up with the Dodgers. It just does because you you're expected to win the division. There's just bigger expectations. Exactly. And I think that he's feeling that. And then like kind of, you know, the 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 contract that he just signed and everything like you sort of feel like, oh, no, (laughs) Shohei Otani. Is this just the beginning of this? Because he did. He looked really good. He looked like, 
you know, the kind of player that that should be, he should be with that kind of a contract. And time will tell, right, what kind of season he has ultimately and whether that this pans out consistently. But he is, we've already seen that from him. I mean, there's no reason to think it won't. Yeah, I mean, baseball is a game. Uh, who was it that said either you're humble or you're about to become humble, mm -hmm. right? And it's humbled Otani more physically than anything else. He's humbled the game mm -hmm. with his ability. And I think we saw that flash last March with Samurai Japan of what it looks like when Shohei Otani's playing for a team that he knows can win as opposed to playing for the Angels. And yeah. that's what we saw a little bit yesterday. Again, one game. He could go 0 for 4 sure. with, with two DPs and two strikeouts today, and we could come back and play the Simpsons you know, <laughs> for him uh, tomorrow. But dang it. Putting him between Betts and Freeman and then just doing that for six months. And that's a that's an intangible that I think when we talk about guys going to the Dodgers and just seeing their level of talent take off in a way that they might not have with another team. Obviously, Shohei Otani, no, his, his level of talent was established before going to the Dodgers. But you are, when you're sandwiched in between guys like that, when you're expected, there's just such an expectation that you're going to win, that you're going to come through, that you're going to make it to the playoffs, things like that. And then a way of doing things. I mean, there's a way of doing things with the Dodgers that is different than a way of doing things with the Los Angeles, Los Angeles angels of Anaheim, whatever they're called now. Are they called that? I think they're just the LA it's, angels. Okay, just the, the LA angels. The LA no. angels. Either way. All right. Yeah. Still <laughs> in Anaheim though. They, Not uh, literally in LA. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, it, it's just a different kind of um, thing, I guess that kind of can sometimes get unlocked inside of a player. Now the Padres are building that. I mean, there was a time when players would come to the Padres. There's no expectations. There's, you know, you're looking around the clubhouse and you're like, we're going to be out of it by July or August. You're just trying to have a good season for yourself, get your numbers where they want to be and probably get yourself some extra money. Right. And so you're building that with the Padres where guys are coming over. You're trying to find those expectations, those expectations of wanting to go to the playoffs and thinking that you should be there year after year after year. So certainly that's not something that's exclusive to the Dodgers, but it is something different. And I love you all in the chat being like, stop Dodger loving. Stop saying a nice thing about Otani. We want Otani to fail. We want him to strike out and lose. And his Ota wife, stop showing her on TV. Otani could have the best season ever. And the Padre uh, the Dodgers could still, you never know, not make the playoffs. Or, I mean, okay. I, no, I feel like I no, sound dumb won't. saying no, that. They so won't. Don't even go there. But one play, I mean, yeah, like, look, it's not, I think what Craig is saying too, it's not just Otani. It's Otani sandwiched in between those other players that kind of makes it more special than what you were seeing with the Angels. Three MVPs in a row. Yeah. They had that stat on ESPN. I, I, I missed it because it was 3 15 in the morning and my head was, you know, halfway there. But I think it was like first time, I think it's the first time ever. That three MVPs active batted one, two, three. Sure. In a lineup. In a lineup like that. Yeah. I mean, that's historic too for them. Uh, that is historic. We were, we were talking about that earlier this week. That That is something that I think literally is factually historic. Yeah. But, but again, I mean, look, this is a long season. You don't know injuries. You don't know for the Padres. They can unleash something within themselves being kind of the underdog again this year, being not having the expectations that they did last year. There's still such a long way to go. And, and look, implosions could happen too i mean uh, all kinds of all, th all kinds of things we are happen. one 160 second of our way mm -hmm. through the season one out of 162 so and again they don't need to beat the dodgers to make the playoffs no they don't however anytime we're going to do that and kind of do any magical thinking i will also just say that kind of game game one that's the kind of game the Padres need to win. They lost last year to game one, right? I, if I remember yeah. correctly, the Padres. Um, it's just something, yeah, inside of you. You want to get that first game. And you know what? It was kind of, it was in their grasp. Well, that's what I mean. Uh, and that was another <clears throat> stat mm -hmm. I think Jason Stark had. But I believe the Padres led the league or were top two or three in the league last year in losses when leading in the eighth inning or later. And the Dodgers led the league in wins when yes. trailing after seven innings or later. So those two things happened again, and it's going to happen. And the Dodgers are a good team. They're hard to beat, but happens too many times. We know at the end of the year, it's going to come down to one or two games for this team. It's gonna, this team's going to win on the razor's edge 
they're going to need to win on the razor's edge a lot right unless they get a significant infusion into their lineup so these are the ones that hurt and again, the things that I think they really need to clean up on the Padre side is like the self-inflicted wounds, not the Jake one. That was bad luck, but um, the walks, the pitch clock violations, obviously any hitting that could have been a little bit more patient, a little bit better at bats, things like that. Like that's what you want to start. You want to take this and go into tomorrow's game and just start cleaning up the things on the margins that they're going to need. And and you know what? Mike Schultz has been preaching all spring yeah. training. We're about the details. So you want to refine those details. The details were good, except Tyler Wade threw a ball away mm -hmm. and another one went through Jake Cronenworth's mm -hmm. glove. And literally, if those two things don't happen, the Padres win the game two exactly. to one. They win the game two to one if Wade makes a routine play to start the third inning. And if Cronenworth's glove doesn't turn into cottage cheese, like someone cast a spell on the glove, like it unraveled as the ball approached it. It's completely nuts. That's why baseball is stupid and no one should watch. Okay, let's take a quick timeout. we got match game coming up shortly. So we're going to take a, a short segment when we come back to make sure that we have plenty of time for match game. If you want to drill in one call here in between 833-288-0973, we have room for one caller in our next segment. So 833-288-0973, if you want to be that person, uh, we will take you. Annie and Elston, roll until two on the fan.
1228 on the fan. Annie and Elston back with you. Tomorrow we do it again at 3 a.m. No watch party tomorrow. Let's just keep that in mind. You're on your own when it comes to a watch party. Feel free to go to Seven Mile Casino. What are the chances you're going to go to Seven Mile Casino and Adam's just going to be there, like, still in his 97.3 the out. fan polo? Just, he's like, can you keep it going? Yeah. I feel I feel the odds are low. Wouldn't it be great, though? <laughs> Wouldn't it be would great be. if you're just like, is that, is that, mm, that's Adam. Is that Adam? Mm-hmm. Just is that stay there Adam the whole time. I see? He just shows up every morning like, hey, guys, want to watch a ball game? Yes. It's a Lakers replay from three days ago, Adam. I don't care. Let's watch. It's Let's 3 a.m. Let's go. Let's do it. Adam the D-Gen is funny because he's such a family man and such a great person and so oh, hardworking. Right. So, like, creating the fantasy world where he's a complete D-Gen yes. and every night at 2 a.m. he's there just playing 5-5 five, five, No Limit. Yeah. Just firing off on three-barrel bluffs on flush draws. I could Stumbling see out later, but then still making it to the studio in time to for the meetings and everything like that. Absolutely. I could see it. Musgrove versus Yamamoto this evening. I guess you could argue maybe. Could could you have pulled the Michael King lever yesterday for for you Darvish or today whatever day we're on. Um would that have been I I mean I guess it's 50-50, right? I mean you got to you got to save Michael King for one or the other. I don't know that I I, I, I trust Michael King. I, I the little that I know about him, I'm going to trust him more than this bullpen right now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I guess I, I, I maybe that, that had to have been plan pre planned. You know, we're going to say Michael King. It's it's a really good question, and th- you know, I Mike didn't really talk about it. We played the Daily Shield at eleven, but mm-hmm. just the feel I got watching the game was that. He, he we was managing from a position of the left-handed bats okay. in the Dodgers lineup. Like I felt like his managing was based on getting left-handed relievers in against mm-hmm. those key lefties. And of course, the difference between their lineup and ours is that there's a key lefty up every inning. Yeah. So that's why you saw Cosgrove in the fourth and then Matsui in the sixth and then Peralta mm-hmm. in the seventh. Mm-hmm. And if you had seen Matsui in the seventh and Peralta in the eighth, you might have had the chance to bridge that gap. But that would have required a right-hander to come in earlier. And that's what I'm yeah. kind of wondering. You've got Musgrove tonight, better against righties than lefties in his career. He's not wildly platoon splitty, but still. Yeah. And then King, kind of the same thing in a way, in terms of sinker slider, not the exact same stuff, but kind of coming at you, same size guy okay. coming at you from the same spot. And and I just wonder about backing those guys up one after the other. Obviously, from a stuff talent standpoint, mm-hmm. it makes perfect sense. But I kind of feel like Schilty's going to want to throw those lefties in there again tonight. Right. Like from a similarity standpoint, you'd want to shake it up a little bit more for the hitters. You'd want to. I mean, it's interesting. Right. And I think we'll we'll I feel like we're going to see Michael King. So we'll see how they use him or how Mike Schultz uses him. But, um, yeah, I did kind of wonder that, like what, what was the reasoning behind that? But that's true. They do have I mean, they're, they're that lineup. You have dominant lefties. They did go with lefties. They were trying to work some matches, matchups there, no doubt about it. I think even going, like you said, to their relievers, maybe a little too early on some things, or you could have maybe switched the order up a little bit in terms of how they how he, they were used. But I didn't hate the management part. I didn't hate the fact that he was trying to get all these matchups and try to make that bullpen work. Um, because you do have these days off after tomorrow. You've got a, you know, basically an entire week before you've got another regular season game. I also, I don't know, did you guys talk about the roster? Let's discuss it just a little bit. Uh, I did just in the most generic sense. I'm confused about Grand Polly. First of all, Grand Polly, congratulations. But if you're not using him every day, what is, where is he? What's happening? What's the point? Where are we going? But, but maybe, I don't know, maybe, I mean, like a game one, like, I don't know, like this, maybe that'll be uncovered, you know? No, I agree with you. The fact that. Polly made the team and then Wade made the start. Right. I was a little confused. I think that's a perfect way to describe it. It's mm-hmm. nothing major. It's no, not like you're, no. you're screaming and throwing something against the wall. And I'm happy for Grand Polly. Like, let's, that's, that's fine. I just want to know how, how they're going to use him. And I get the idea of using a guy who's been in seven major league seasons 
as the opening day starter as opposed to a kid who's never been in the big leagues at all. So I, I do, I, I get it. But if Grand Pauly's going to be on the bench, not only is that malpractice to Grand Pauly's development as a young player, it's literally the opposite of what Mike Schultz said, mm-hmm. said he wants. Uh, and something that Ben and Woods have talked about, because I don't know if you heard, but they went to dinner with Mike Schilt uh, at P.F. Chang's. And one I didn't of the, hear that. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and they said there's yeah. a lot that they couldn't tell us, you know, in terms of like really cool inside stuff. But that in general, they could relay that Mike Schilt didn't want to have young players on his bench that weren't playing. Mm-hmm. He wanted those players to get the ABs they need to develop. I don't see it for Graham Pauly, period. Like unless he was going to go five for his next 11 grab a starting spot like Jake Cronenworth did in 2020 and just like never let go uh, because he hits 380 for a month or something like that. I see Paulie as a guy that is going to alternate with Wade and Eggy Rosario and get in there here and there. Mm -hmm. And as such, he should be in the minor leagues. And, and, and also as such, I firmly believe this team's going to sign a veteran player before March 28th. And then Paulie will go to the minors. That's that could also be very possible. I mean, I did hear on the drive over. I, I agree with you that AJ Preller hedged this roster so that he can make decisions later. He pushed some things off, which is totally fine. That's exactly what he should have done. Right. Uh, hey, Luis Patino. We called yeah, that, didn't yeah. we? Did we call that? <laughs> He's got some inflammation. The day <laughs> that he arrived three weeks late to training camp, he couldn't get into a game or like, I wonder when Luis Patino is going to feel some tingling sensation or some numbness, some soreness. You know, because inflammation is just, it's a very broad term. Literally every time you throw, <laughs> your your elbow experiences inflammation. It's just a matter of when it calms down. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting because this is not, they're going to be still changes is, is what we're essentially saying. Like there's going to be some tweaks. They're going to relook at some things. They're getting through this with like their playoff roster or whatever, but they're punting a few of the decisions to when they get back for the opening day giants as they should. A uh, couple of quick things in the chat. Rob uh, says, is that a picture of Dave Roberts on the wall behind Elston? Uh, why? Yes, it is. It was a, a birthday gift. Uh, from Ben and Woods to Ben. That's a picture of Ben and Dave Roberts hugging. And it says, Ben, you're doing a, you do a great job. It's Dave Roberts telling Ben how much he loves him. Mm. So that is there to make Ben feel miserable and yet somewhat proud every day. It's kind of a mixed feeling. Every time he's like, oh yeah, Dave Roberts thinks very highly of me. And then, oh, Dave Roberts thinks really highly of me. And everyone gets to see Dave Roberts behind whoever's sitting in that chair. Yeah, which is normally there's a a, <laughs> a step and repeat here with like a baseball and, right. and some social media handles. But that was put up at Seven Mile Casino today. So now you see, yeah. you see the dirt, you see how the sausage is made, the psychic sausage is made. There it is. The mental torture of Ben Higgins every day when he walks in here. Ben, you do a great job. Signed Dave Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my god Barry in the chat Schilt is not the right manager for this team Stop, I'm not even reading another piece Of that post Barry, go take a nap Go take a nap You've been up since 3 You've been a cranky pants since 545 Nobody liked the way you handled yourself In the drive through this morning no one liked the way that you handled your Starbucks order. You're snapping at people at your office. And now you're saying Mike Schilt is not the right manager for the team after one game. Chill it, man. Nap time. Settle in. Put on some white noise. Let the head hit that pillow. You're going to feel so much better when We're, you get up. Maybe Barry's doing a bit. Should we give him the benefit of the doubt there? Or do you think he's serious? I would like to hope it's a bit. Okay. Speaking of bits. Either way. It's time. Let's do it. It's time for match game. We are looking for two contestants to play the match game today. Match game 97.3. Coming up in our next segment, you'll be attempting to match our all-star panel of Annie Heilbrunn, Matt Scraby, Adam Klug, and Braden Suprenit. Whoever does a better job through two rounds will be the winner. 
and qualified for a two-night stay at Fontainebleau, Las Vegas, and dinner for two. We play match game next. Call in 833-288-0973 if you want to be one of our two opponents today, our two contestants. You'll be taking on one another, not taking on us. We're going to work to try and help you. 833-288-0973. Looking for two contestants for match games. We play silly games when we come back. Annie and Elston on the fan.
Let's get silly. It's 1244. Welcome back. Annie and Elston here. We have talked about that bummer late inning loss plenty. Let's put it completely aside for the rest of the show. We'll let Gwen and Chris and Scraby mess with that nonsense coming up at two o'clock. It's time for silly games. It's time for our favorite silly game. Now let's roll the bumper. It's time to match the stars. Annie Heilbrunn. Adam Klug. Matt Scraby, Braden Sopredent, as we play the star-studded big money match game 97-3. And let's welcome in today's contestants. First up, we've got Sean. Hi, Sean. Welcome to Match Game. How are you? Very good. Thanks. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, just working today. Caught me on my lunch break. Uh I was going to try to take a nap after uh, a late night of watching my Padres, but decided to call in. Fair enough. That nap can wait like 15 minutes, and then you're golden. Sean, you're up today against Danny in San Diego. Hi, Danny. Welcome to Match Game. Hey, great to be here. Uh, first time contestant. I'm excited. All right. We got Sean versus Danny. Guys, have you ever watched the classic Match Game? Do you know what we're doing here? I'm familiar. Uh, it's been a while. Well, here's what's going to happen, guys. We're going to play this game in two rounds. In each round, each of you will get one question apiece. I'll give the prompt, at which point our panel will put down their answers to a question. When they're done, I will give you that same question and get your answer. And the number of people you match on the panel is the number of points you get. At the end of two rounds, whoever has the most points is the winner. And whoever is the winner is qualified for our grand prize, a two-night stay at Fontainebleau, Las Vegas, and a $150 dinner credit there. Sound good? Yep. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. All right, guys, let's go. It's time for round one. Sean, you called in first, so you're going to go first, and I give you the opportunity to select either question A or question B. Uh, let's go with A. All right, question A. Panel, lock in. The caveman said to his neighbor, you better put a leash on your dinosaur dinger. Last night, he got loose and gnawed on my blank. Oh, man. Wait, one more time. <laughs> the caveman said to his neighbor, you better put a leash on your dinosaur dinger. Last night he got loose and he gnawed on my blank. Thinking music. Hmm. Panel is putting their answers in. Caveman said to his neighbor, you better put a leash on your dinosaur dinger. That was for you, by the way, Braden, the dinger part. I like this. Last oh. night he got loose and he gnawed on my blank. Done. Annie, done? Sure, done. Adam? I'm done. As, as done as done is going to be. All <laughs> right. Okay, all right. Panel is ready. So, Sean, now I turn to you, good sir, and I say to you, the caveman said to his neighbor, you better put a leash on your dinosaur dinger. Last night he got loose and he gnawed on my... I'm going to guess it rhymes and go with finger oh finger dinger on the finger wow <laughs> that is a good answer good answer let's see if it's a match to any of our celebrities annie halbron i had flowers not on my flower <laughs> the flowers like, like, like a the dog neighbor? yeah triceratops Comes, right an herbivore sure. he's a... <laughs> yeah he is an herbivore <laughs> <laughs> i went with leg i'm not in my leg i think that's that was kind of what i was thinking I'm trying about to too. be more general mm -hmm. I like I Adam. was too, and I got flowers. I want our listeners to win. I gave both a specific answer and a more generic answer. I went with crops or food. <laughs> I'm thinking you know, back in the day, you know, crops. Crops. essentially the farmers. Farmer back in the day yeah, of a caveman right, yeah. and a okay. dinosaur. Right. The cave, the farmer caveman. <laughs> you know, his crops are under attack by Dinger. <laughs> uh, now to the biggest Dinger enthusiast. Here's Brady. Right. I put glove specifically jake's <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one yeah. specifically Jake that explains glove. everything that's right it was the triceratops the triceratops oh, did it oh no it, no matches for you that round sean but hang on you've got another chance but right now let's turn to danny uh danny here comes question b and your question in round one the 102 year old man said 
today I can do the very same things I did when I was 20. <laughs> Only now I need blank. What kind of show is this? Yeah. The 102-year-old man said, Today I can do the very same things I did when I was 20. Only now I need blank. Ooh, definitely not going with my first instinct. On okay, this one. not this time. Me too. <laughs> Don't um, guess the tiny blue pill. <laughs> right. Hey, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> anything's fair in love and war. Panel, let me know when you're ready. 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 All right. Danny, now it's your turn. The 102 year old man said, Today I can do the same things I did when I was 20. Only now I need. So I feel like the prompt wants me to go blue. I'm thinking blue, specifically Viagra. Blue pill. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Except I wasn't going with it. Only now I need, you know, the I little blue okay. pill. The little blue pill is the answer. That. That's what we're looking for, Annie. I just went with I just vitamins. Went with... <laughs> vitamins. Oh, I think we give it no, to No, it does not match my head. <laughs> That's not a vitamin. It's not I have checked at CVS. Trust me, it's not there Whoa. in the vitamin aisle. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Moving on. What did Matt say? For the record, uh, I was Chris Ello being the 102-year-old man until we <laughs> started talking about blue pills. <laughs> Caffeine. Oh, Caffeine, all right. All right, all right. Okay. I went with more time. Need twice as long to do it. I think that is a great it. answer. I think that's a great answer. Oh, Just wow. a little more time. Just takes a little longer is all. <laughs> Let's put total T. <laughs> oh, <laughs> close. 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 You're right there. <laughs> Craig, I think we're going to have to have a little talk after the show. <laughs> no, I think it was a good one. That was a very good one. Okay, so listen, it's a tie right now. A zero, zero. Uh, so, Danny, this time you're going to get to go first in round two. This is the second and final round. So you have the option of question A or question B. Let's stick with B. Sticking with B. Here we go. Panelists, get ready. See if you can match Danny. Here All we right, go. Danny. Paul said, I just saw the world's strangest wedding. Instead of a regular suit, the groom was wearing a blank suit. Paul said, I just saw the world's strangest wedding. Instead of a regular suit, the groom was wearing a blank suit. I got it. We got this one. Yeah. I got one. Done. Not very good this time. All right. The panel is ready. So, Danny, it's back to you. Paul said, I saw the world's strangest wedding. Instead of a regular suit, the groom was wearing a what? I... I got to hope somebody matches with birthday suit. A birthday suit. Wearing his birthday suit. I feel good for your chances here, Danny. Let's go to our all-star panel. Annie Halbrun. Birthday suit. Wow. Hey. That's one match. Max Gravy. <laughs> you know, I, since we're going in this direction, that was my first instinct. I went back to it. Birthday suit. Oh, two matches hey. for Danny. Adam? I guess I'm the bad guy who went bathing suit. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's still a good try. I mean, it is San Diego. That's true. And I Brady. also went with swimsuit. So. Swimsuit. Oh, Fair enough. I like it. Beachy. Beachy. Swimsuit. Beachy. <laughs> Beach All right. Two, two matches for Danny. All right, Sean. So here's the situation. It's your last prompt. If you get two matches, you tie. Three matches, you win the game. Sean, here's your question. Panelists, ready? Mm -hmm. Terrific Tommy said i'll sign with your team but korea's a bit far to go it would be better if you played that series in blank hmm. terrific tommy said i'll sign with your team but korea it's a bit far it would be better if you played that series in blank Done. Done. I'm done. I'm done. All right. <laughs> curious we're going to have a tie here. <laughs> All right, Sean. Here's your chance. You need two matches to tie. You need three to be the champion. Terrific Tommy said, I'll sign with your team, but Korea's a bit too far. It would be better if you played that series in... 
I'm going to go with uh, our beloved uh, Petco Park, specifically, so San Diego. San Diego. Better if you just played it in San Diego. Played it at home. Annie? I got you, San wow. Diego. Uh -huh. oh. All right. One match yeah. for Sean. You need one more to tie. Matt Scravey. Sorry, chat. Las Vegas. I was going to go. That's Tommy's. I thought yeah. we were talking That's about Tommy's. Yeah. 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 We are. Yeah. We are. Yeah. I, I felt you on that. I also have you, San Diego. Oh, that's wow. two matches in the tie. Holy cow. Braden could send you into the winner's circle. I also picked Vegas. Oh. Vegas. Wow. Do we have Dang. a tiebreaker? Do you have a tiebreaker? We do. We have a tiebreaker. Here we go. We mm -hmm. have a tiebreaker to decide this. All panelists play once again. Uh, Sean, A or B? Uh, we'll stick with the way it's been. I'll go with A. Okay. This is a very simple one, all right? We want your best blank. Flying blank. Hmm. Okay. This, is, this is a tiebreaker, just a one-word one. Flying blank. Okay. Done. 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 And I'm surprised, Scraby, and I don't have the same answer. All right, Sean. Oh, wow, yes. What do you have for me, Sean? Flying blank. Oh, man, I have no idea. Flying fish. Flying fish. That's good. Oh, That's okay. Good. That right. is a good answer. All right. Annie? Flying saucer. Flying saucer. <laughs> Matt? Should have went with that, but it's squirrel. Flying, flying squirrel. Fl Rocky love, the flying squirrel. I love flying squirrels. <laughs> Adam? <laughs> They're great. Sc Scraby and I are fellow UFO enthusiasts. We are. we are. I also went saucer. Flying saucer. A Braden, we're looking for a flying fish. Pigs. Pigs oh, fly. No. Oh, my. no matches for Sean. Danny, you just need one match, and you are the champion today. Here's your tiebreaker. Circus blank. Circus blank. Circus blank. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Done. Got it. Done. Danny, this is for the win, my friend. Right. Circus there's Blank. A couple, but I'm there's a couple, but I'm thinking go Circus Tent. Circus oh, Tent. Oh, wow. Good one. I said Circus Freak. Circus Freak? <laughs> wow. Geez. Wow, jeez. <laughs> I said Circus Animal. Circus Animal? I don't know what that is, actually. Circus Animal. I got Clown. Circus Clown. <laughs> also a Circus Animals. Oh, okay. Oh. I immediately thought Good double bugs here. we're blowing, we're blowing out the clock. <laughs> <laughs> what if you were supposed to get that right? Bummer. It's okay. We're going to go to a second tiebreaker, Whoa. guys. Okay. This is unprecedented. This is unprecedented. It's like extra innings on yes. opening day. It's like playing <laughs> a game like... at three in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I is. was concerned for a minute. Today's game was going to go extra innings. <laughs> yeah, I know. We all were. I'm and sure. now it has. <laughs> Sean, your second tiebreaker is. San Diego blank. San Diego blank. Done. I'm, just gonna done. Count that. Okay, I'm done too. If he doesn't get this one, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> it's your turn. What do you got? San Diego Padres. San Diego Padres. Well done. I put Friar, but they all put Padres. So I put we're Padres. Fine. Too. Three wow. Padres. Three Padres. <laughs> nice. Oh my goodness! I would have picked I would have picked Sakus, of course, but, <laughs> but that's fine. That's fine. That's 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 a good job. All right, Danny, your second tiebreaker. You need three to tie four to win. Is national blank? National blank. Better not cause another tie here. <laughs> well, that's on you guys. <laughs> you can decide on your own to end this game. Ready. Ready? I'm ready, yeah. So am I. All right, Danny, here we go. Your answer to right. National Blank. Hopefully everybody put down National League. National oh, League. God. No, not me. National Lampoon. National uh, Park. I went with League. Oh, oh three wow. to two. Wow. Also, wow. I also win League, so we got two of them. Like, Sean, congratulations in the longest match game ever. You are the champion. Congrats. Yes. Great job, guys. Great job. You've been qualified for our grand prize for two nights stay at Fontainebleau, Las Vegas, and dinner for two. Sean, hang on the line. Braden will get your information. We're overdue for a break. Panelists, thank you. Great job, thank you. everybody.
Annie and Elston back with hour number four. We're going to pick the entire NCAA bracket based on Coach's favorite music when we come back on the fan. Hour number four of the show coming at you just a couple minutes late because we had the longest silly game yet. Match game went to a double tiebreaker round. Congratulations to Sean. He's qualified now for the grand prize drawing at the end of the month. Congratulations, Sean. And thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for participating. 
I like how Matt Scravey said he's going to practice at this game now. Yeah. Try and sharpen his sword. He's going to ask his wife, like a, a studio audience was asked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's going to be checking out the match games from 1973. I mean, that's the way to do it. That's mm -hmm. the way to do it. Because if you did go to old YouTube match game compilations, you may find the actual questions that you just heard on the show. I don't for think example. we would. I don't think we would. You would have heard three of them. And Tommy and so I changed a couple of names okay, to protect the innocent. Okay. The Tommy fam one that was completely. I mean, not Tommy. Tommy terrific. Tommy. Terrific, the Tommy terrific yeah. one was uh, an Elston original, but the other three were adapted from the writers' room of Match Game seventy three right. or seventy four or seventy five or seventy six. Still standing the test of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I, I watched the show and I, I would just say at least half of the questions from the 70s are completely unfit to be said in the 2020s. So it's always funny when Adam's like, that's a little close. I'm like, uh, believe me, check, forget the ones that I, I didn't you use. Skip. Yeah, you should give me credit for the ones that we didn't do. So, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a lot of fun. Uh, tomorrow we're back to fast money. So hopefully we can qualify again. But we're having a lot of time, a lot of fun on silly games. Speaking of silly. And kind of a game that we could play. Right now, on Annie and Elston, we're going to take a sports talk radio old hand staple. And we're going to liven it up. Give it a fresh new twist. And a little lemon zest on top. And see if we've got an all new creation. Because Braden, Annie, sent us uh, just a day or two ago. I think it was yesterday, right? You sent us this. I saw it yesterday, yeah. Uh, this was from Matt Norlander on CBSSports.com. He went to, not literally walked to, but he contacted all of the coaches in the NCAA tournament and asked them for their favorite musical artist. For whoever they like the best, the band or artist that means the most to them. And then he redid the bracket. Instead of the universities, I mean, we still know which university, but it was the coach and their favorite artist. So now we're going to decide who wins the national championship based on only this. Okay. I mean, that's just as scientific as anything else we could do today, <laughs> right? Like, do we want to waste everyone's time and pretend like we know everything about all 67 no, of these games? we want to go like, with music. I really think that it's going to be tough for the Illini. There, there. Like, no. Let's do it, Braden. How are we going to do this, man? What are we doing? How are we doing it? Do we need music? What I do think we need? need music to... Woo! like it. All right. Uh, here's your East region. Uh, the 116 matchup... I got to pull up like an actual bracket, too, just to see if we can play this out. Let's get through the East first. Uh, Dan Hurley, the head coach of the Yukon Huskies, his favorite band is Pearl Jam... Stetson Hatter's head coach, Donnie Jones, likes casting crows. Not casting counting crowns. crowns. Not casting crowns. Not counting crows. I thought that, I, that's what I thought it was. Okay, yeah. I think I like Pearl Jam better. Yeah, but. I don't even know casting crowns. I don't crowns. either. I'm Pearl Jam. All right, so. Pearl Jam advances. We're advancing UConn's Pearl Jam. Dan Hurley moves on to the next round. Uh, Dusty May was getting some flack for this. They don't actually believe he listens to Rod Wave. But then in... A counter to that, he actually posted his Spotify list and all of the Rod <laughs> Wave songs it's that he has it's like, look at this. On, <laughs> on social media. Uh, so Dusty May of Ford Atlantic, uh, his head coach, Rod Wave, babyface for Chris Collins, head coach in Northwestern. Mm. I vote Dusty May. I'm voting Dusty May. I vote babyface, but okay. All right, you lose. Yeah. Two to one. Two one. Uh, so Advance. UConn will take on Northwestern in the round of 32. Setting State Aztecs, Brian Dutcher, Bruce Springsteen is his favorite. Thoughts on Bruce Springsteen? I love that it's Bruce. I love that this is Brian Dutcher's favorite. That Bruce Springsteen is by. Ugh. Yes, I love it. I think it's on par. <laughs> UAB's Andy Kennedy's favorite musical artist is Bob Marley. That's a tough 5 12. Wow, that is a hard matchup I in am the Bob first Marley. round. Sorry, Brian Dutcher. I'm Bob Marley, too, over Bruce Springsteen. Oh, no. Aztecs out in the first round in a sweep. Bob Marley. Yeah. Bob Marley advancing. But I love, I see this for Brian Dutcher, and I love it. I'm filling out a bracket right mm -hmm. now to do to keep up. We three little birds just advanced Marley past Springsteen. <laughs> Bruce Pearl, Auburn's head coach in a 4-13 matchup. Kenny Chesney, Yale's James Jones like Marvin Gaye. 
I got Marvin Gaye on that one. I think Kenny Chesney's kind of cheesy, so I'm going to go with Marvin Gaye. I got Gaye. Marvin Gaye all the way. Yale, little mm-hmm. upset special there. Get out of here, Bruce Pearl. Mm-hmm. Mark Pope, head coach of BYU, likes Taylor Swift. Okay. Keith Dambrot of Duquesne likes Billy Currington. Don't even know who that is, so I'll go Taylor I, Swift. I like Billy Currington. He's a good artist. I'm sure Taylor I, Swift I'm will advance. Taylor, yes. So BYU <laughs> advances. Uh, nice try, though. Brad <laughs> Underwood, Morgan Wallen, Preston Spardlin. Or Spradlin of Moorhead State says Jeremy Camp. I'm going to go with Morgan Wallet. Mm, I'll play. follow you there. That's fine. Uh, sure. I don't know either of these. No, sure. Country music out of yeah. there. So. <laughs> Kyle Smith, Washington State, Digital Underground, taking on Drake Bulldogs, uh, Darian DeVries. Luke Combs is his favorite artist. Digital like- Underground. Let's go. I pick Luke Combs. I'm Digital Underground. On this one. I've never yes. even heard of Digital Annie and Elston <laughs> together. <laughs> Pushing uh, Digital Iowa State's head coach, TJ <laughs> Otzelberger, Ed Sh- uh, Sharon, uh, and then S- South Dakota State's Jack Rabbits, Eric Henderson, John Mellencamp. Wow. As much for Jack Rabbits as for Mellencamp, I'll go with Mellencamp. I'm going Ed Sharon. I'm Ed. Iowa State advances. Glad I put my vote down. To the next round. We'll go to the round of 32. We got UConn's Pearl Jam for Dan Hurley going against Florida Atlantic's Rod Wave. Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam. UAB's Bob Marley for Andy Kennedy versus Yale's Marvin Gaye for James Jones. Marley. I'm Marley, too. I'm Marley as well. Uh, BYU's Taylor Swift against Illinois' Morgan Wallen. I vote Morgan Wallen. Taylor. Taylor. So lame. Sorry, Braden. Washington State's Digital <laughs> Underground versus Iowa State's Ed Sheeran. Digital Underground. Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. <laughs> Sweet 16, UConn's Pearl Jam versus UAB's Bob Marley. Marley. I'll go with Marley. Marley. BYU's Taylor Swift versus <laughs> Ed Sheeran. Out, I'll take Taylor UConn. Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. UAB, BYU, Taylor Swift versus Bob Marley. I'm taking Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Let's go, Bob. Wow. <laughs> Bob Marley, the final four. Don't worry How about you, it. Hey, I mean, that's like iconic. Region. Like, you UAB know, you know. is making it to the final four. Who knew? Hey, listen, at least the Aztecs lost to a final four team. It's pretty good. That's true. That's true. Might lose to the champion. We're going to go to the West region next, not the South. Uh, Herbert Davis, the number one seed in North Carolina, their head coach likes little Dirk. We're going to pick Wagner since they beat Howard. Donald Copeland likes Jay-Z. I'm going to go with Jay-Z and Wagner. Yeah, I got to go Jay-Z on that. Jay-Z. Sorry, Hubert Davis. You're out. <laughs> <laughs> One seed upset. Done. 8-9 uh, matchup. Chris Jans, Mississippi State head coach, Dave Matthews Band, Tom Izzo, Jackson 5. <laughs> I love Dave Matthews Band, so I'll pick that. I'm going to go DMB right there. I'm going Jackson 5. Wow, DMB with the advance. <laughs> That's good. St. Mary's, Randy Bennett's favorite artist, Bruce Springsteen. Bryce Drew's favorite artist for Grand Canyon's Toby Mack. Bruce Str- Springsteen. I'll yeah. take Springsteen. Springsteen as well. NATO head coach Alabama likes Toby Mack as well. Charleston's coach Pat Kessley likes Jay Z. There Jay-Z. can only be one Jay Z in the bracket, can't there? Well, there's two Toby Macks too. I'm gonna go with Jay Z. We'll see. We'll, we'll run into a problem if we. They're gonna run into each other at some point. Maybe. All right. Well, hey, fine. I'll take no, Jay Z. Have too. no fear of Dave Matthews band there, Craig. Yeah. Uh, Clemson's head coach Brad uh, Bronnell, Chris Stapleton. Richard Bettino likes Dave Matthews Band, too. I'm going to go with Chris Stapleton on this one. I'm going Dave Matthews Band on this one. What? I'll take Stapleton there, so there's only one there's DMB. Only one DMB. It's like a DMB advantage. Highlander situation. There can <laughs> yeah. only be one. we got a lot of common ones there. Scott Drew's head coach of Baylor, Elevation Worship. Matt Langle of, of Colgate likes Coldplay. I don't I'll, even know what Elevation Worship is, so I'll pick Coldplay. I'll I'm, take yeah, Coldplay same well. Coldplay. Uh, Dayton Flyers head coach, Anthony Grant likes Lauren Daigle. Okay. Uh, Steve Alford of Nevada likes Sanctus Real. I don't know who either of those people yeah, are. Yeah, neither. I'll, I'll, I'll take the woman, I'll Lauren take Diggle. Lauren too. All right, Dayton yeah. advances. Arizona's Tommy Lloyd likes the Beastie Boys. Nice. Dan Monson of Long Beach State likes Old Dominion. I'll go with the bad, bad Beastie Boys. Of course it's the be- of course it's Beastie Boys and Old Dominion. That's another university. That's not a band. It is a band. They're a country artist. Okay, fine. Uh, Wagner's Jay Z. Against Mississippi State, Dave Matthews Band. I'm voting for Dave Matthews Band just because Jay Z's later in the bracket. Well, me too, because like of that them. same reason. I like them over Jay Z. Anyway. Uh, and he doesn't get the pick. <laughs> Look at that. As long as Jay Z's coming up later, we didn't bump them all. Randy, for Randy, Randy Bennett, Band. Bruce Springsteen, Charleston's Pat, Kelsey's Jay Z. All right. Well, there's Jay Z right Jay-Z. there. You can take Jay Z right against there. Against who? Uh, against Springsteen. Springsteen. Oh, Jay Z. 
Uh, Clemson, Chris Stapleton is their pick from their head coach going against Colgate's cold play. I'll, I'll go take, Stapleton I'm there. I'm taking Stapleton too. Fine. Fine. <laughs> you lose. Uh, Dayton, the girl we don't know, Arizona, the Beastie Boys. Beastie, Beastie, Boys. Boys. Beastie Boys. Sweet 16, Dave Matthews Band versus Charleston's Jay-Z. Dia B can't knock up Jay-Z twice, no, can they? No, no. Jay-Z comes Jay-Z. back this time. Yeah. I pick Dave Matthews Band. Jay-Z wins 2-1. Uh, Clemson, Arizona would be Chris Stapleton versus the Beastie Boys. I'll take Chris Stapleton and Clemson. Beasties. Beastie. Older people over here. Wow. Charleston and Arizona. Wow. That would be wow. Jay Z okay. and uh, Beasties, Beastie right? Boys. I'll take Beastie Boys over Jay Z. Beastie Boys to the final four. Wow. Go against Taylor Swift. We'll see how I long that lasts. I took Jay Z on that one, but okay. Fair enough. Do you want? I make lost. It, you just want to make it known. You just want to make it known. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I good. Do. I, I do want you to make it known. Head coach of uh, Houston, Kevin Sampson likes the Eagles. Griff Aldrich of Longwood likes Hillsong. I'll take the Eagles. Yeah, come on. Eagles. Hillsong. Nebraska and Texas A&M eight nine. Fred Hoiberg of Nebraska likes Queen. Texas A&M likes Buzz Williams likes the Doobie Brothers. This is a good matchup. I'll take Queen. Queen. I'll take Doobie Brothers, even though Queen advances. Greg Gard of Wisconsin likes Luke Combs. Mark uh, Bingington of James Madison likes Pearl Jam. I'll take Luke Combs. Um, Pearl Jam. I think Luke should get in his fast car and get the heck out of here. Pearl Jam. John Shire likes Drake. Duke's head coach. Vermont Catamounts head coach. John Becker likes the Black Crows. Drake. I know it's going to be Drake, so I'll I'll say Drake. Drake. Uh, Texas Tech, Grant McElson likes Jervis Campbell. N- NC State's Kevin Keats likes Michael Jackson. Michael. Michael. I'll always vote against Michael Jackson, so Jervis Campbell. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Uh, John, Calip- John Calipari likes Drake. Did he hurt you? Kentucky. No, but other people he did. <laughs> Greg Camp likes the Eagles. Drake versus the Eagles. This is another match. This could happen again. I'll take the I'll take Drake. I'm not a big fan of the Eagles. I don't believe that John Calipari actually likes Drake. I think he is fronting for his players, and I will take Greg Campy's uh, authentic Eagles. Or the Unfortunately, fact that they... I take Drake. <laughs> Unless we're not trying to have Drake twice, then take the Eagles. Well, they're, they're both twice. Oh, yeah. The Eagles beat know. Hillsong right. or whatever. Uh, Todd Golden of Florida likes Sublime. Actually, we got to pick a playing game first. Do you want Michael Jackson or the Beatles? We already know Michael. I'm, J- he I'm doesn't like Michael Jackson. I don't like really like the Beatles, so I'll take Michael Jackson. Annie, you're the I'm Michael maker. Jackson. Sorry. All right, so Leon Rice <laughs> and the Boise State Broncos will take on Florida's Todd Golden's favorite band, Sublime. I'll take Sublime. I will actually take Sublime too. LBC mm-hmm. Sublime. Shaka Smart likes Tupac. Marquette's head coach, Stephen Lutz, or Steve Lutz for West Kentucky likes Jimmy Buffett. Tupac. Tupac. I'll take Tupac over Jimmy Buffett. Let's go, Shaka. You guys aren't that old. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and RIP Jimmy Buffett. Eagles <laughs> for Houston going against Nebraska's Queen. I'll take Queen. Yeah, me too. James Madison's Pearl Jam versus Her three. Duke's Drake. I'll take Pearl Jam. Drake. <laughs> Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam advances. James Get Madison's out of here, on Drake. a roll. NC State. Michael Jackson. Kentucky Drake. 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 All right. Get out of here, MJ. I'll take MJ over that, but it doesn't matter. MJ uh, Sharpie. Sublime versus Tupac. I'll take Sublime just to throw a wrinkle in there. I'll take Tupac. Long Beach. You can't get me off Long Beach. Sublime. <laughs> Let's go. Sublime for Florida advancing. Uh, your final here, uh, Sweet 16, Nebraska, James Madison, Kentucky, and Florida. I'm sure this will be a great bracket. Um, <laughs> Queens. Fred Hoiberg likes Queen. That is uh, going against Mark Bingington Pearls Jam for James Madison. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Queen. I'm going Queen as well. Yeah. All right. Kentucky's Drake for John Calipari. Todd Golden Sublime. I'll go Sublime. I thought we just Drake. You know so what I'm gonna do? Did this. Sublime. Sublime. Yeah. Sublime. <laughs> as long as Braden is picking Sublime, I'm picking Sublime. So Sublime's advancing. <laughs> Queen versus Sublime, Nebraska and Florida. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna wait. Who are you taking, Craig? Sublime. Annie? Queen. 
Florida Gator Sublime. <laughs> Let's go. Sweet final four appearance for the Florida Gators. Do 40 not, ounces to freedom, Florida. Let's go. Do not fill out your bracket like this. Again, we are picking the bracket based on what the head coach of every NCAA tournament team's favorite artist is. Last region we got to the Midwest region. Per, uh, first game, playing game. Matt Logie likes Chris Stapleton for Montana State. Grambling State's head coach, Dante Jackson, likes Young Jeezy. I'm oh. taking Chris Stapleton. I'm going with Young Jeezy. I don't gonna, even know who Young I'm going to go with Young Jeezy, too. Young Jeezy versus mm-hmm. Matt Painter's Zach Brown Band. Ew. Ew. I don't mind Zach Brown Band. I'm going to go with Young Jeezy still. I still don't even know who Young Jeezy is. I can't have Purdue lose in the first round like they do in every other way. So I'll say Zach Brown. Band. Wow. <laughs> The courtesy pick from Craig. <sighs> I, was, I was upset with Zach Eady being upset last year. That's it. Danny Sprinkle at Utah State likes Prince. Amazing. TCU, Jamie Dixon likes Tim McGraw. Prince Easy is better Prince. than Tim McGraw. Easy Prince. Prince. I don't know what we're and, doing here, Jamie. Yeah. It's like not even a contest. Utah Mark, State's going to the final four. And if you didn't say Prince, I would walk out. Mark Few likes Luke Combs of Gonzaga. McNeese State. Will Wade likes Earth, Wind, and Fire. I'll take Earth, Wind, and Fire. Heck yeah. Earth, Earth Wind, and Fire. Yeah, I'm with you. Kansas Bill Self also likes Earth, Wind, and Fire. Copycat. Uh, so they would play Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, Bucky <laughs> McMillan says advance. Sam Cook. I think it's fair for Earth, Wind, and Fire to automatically advance and, and eliminate right. one another. Yeah. I will take Kansas them. Kansas and State. Uh, South Carolina's head coach Lamont Paris likes Tupac. Dana Altman, Oregon head coach, likes the Eagles. I'll take Tupac. 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 Greg McDermott, head coach of Creighton, likes Jimmy Buffett. John Groach of... Akron likes Michael Jackson. Parrothead. I'll take Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, especially since we know MJ is going to be out anyway with well, Craig. And, oh, and so. MJ is the next pick, too, for Rodney Terry. <laughs> Texas's head coach's favorite musician is MJ, but we have a playing game. Tony Bennett. Do you just want to go with Prince anyway? Colorado State already advanced. Right, so, so. Prince versus Michael Jackson. Prince. I'm going to go with Michael Jackson just to keep things off. Oh, my Fair. God. Prince. Well, we're going to have But two. Prince won. We already have multiple princes here. They're going to okay. face each other and advance. Uh, Carrie Underwood <laughs> for Rick Barnes. Rick Barnes' favorite artist is Carrie Underwood? That's that's, kinda, that's interesting. Yeah, I'd like to pause and put a yeah, wait pin a minute. in that one. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, Rick. Rick Bar- okay. <laughs> Tell right. me about your three favorite Carrie Underwood songs. That's right. Bashir Mason, the head coach of the St. Peter's Peacocks, likes Jay-Z. What you- Jay-Z. I like Carrie Underwood. <laughs> Come on. Jay-Z. All right, Jay-Z. Advances. Carrie Underwood. Go back to American Idol. Oh, you don't have to be mean about it. I'm yeah, just saying wow. in this bracket. <laughs> somebody get out of this it. bracket somebody and back Carrie, to American Idol. What did Carrie Underwood do to you? Nothing. Jeez. Just sing some songs, make a lot of money. Uh, so we're just going to have Prince. Incredibly Monday successful. Football. Sunday Night Football? She's one Sunday of those footballs. Football. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the uh, top part is done. South Carolina's Tupac versus Creighton's Jimmy Buffett. Tupac. 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 Colorado State's Prince versus St. Peter's Jay-Z. Prince. 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 Okay, so now you have Prince versus Earth, Wind, and Fire in Danny Sprinkle's Utah State and Kansas's Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm. And then you have on the bottom side, you have South Carolina's Tupac and St. Peter's, or sorry, Colorado State's Prince. I want Prince to face each other on both sides of the bracket and then advance. So that's what right. I'm always voting Prince. I won't ever vote against Prince. Right, so well, Prince I, makes the final four. Out I'm of this voting group. against Prince on both for Fair. <laughs> particular reasons. Which Prince do you want in the final four? Which Mountain West school? Utah the one State with the guitar. We want the one who plays the guitar. That one. Do you want Utah State or? Well, they're neither. Neither of them are playing the guitar on this picture. Oh, shoot. Uh, let's. Oh, hey, uh, you test. We're making money for San Diego State either way. That's Wonderful. right. So let's go with great Osabor and Utah State. There you go. All right. So now we're going to get to the final four for you guys, which would be uh, Taylor Swift. I know whose favorite artist was Taylor Swift. Oh, BYU's Mark Pope. Uh, Taylor Swift versus Arizona's Beastie Boys. Taylor Swift versus Beastie Boys in the national semifinal. Taylor Swift. I vote Beasties. I vote Beasties, too. Whatever. Go Beasties. You're a super Beastie boy. I thought for sure you'd pick Taylor Swift. Got like six Beastie Boy albums on All right, so BYU's in the national championship. Uh, Florida Sublime versus Utah State's Prince. I'll pick Sublime. (gasps) Prince. Prince. Guy couldn't do it. 
BYU's or sorry, uh, we have the Beastie Boys versus Prince versus Prince for the national championship. I'll take. Wait, uh, the Beastie Boys versus Prince. Prince. I'll take the Beastie Boys just to throw things off. Purple Rain. Mm. All right. You picked Prince mm. to win the bracket. So everybody filling out their bracket that's following along, you want Utah State to win the national championship. Wow. <laughs> Look at this. So much money for the Mountain West. However, a little bit bittersweet for San Diego State that they don't make the championship so, and Utah Dutch. State wins. In fact, they, in fact, they lost in the first in round. The first to round. UAB. It's well, tough you know, life. You got It's tough going against Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. And UAB made it deep, right, to the final eight. I think so. The Elite Eight. So that's okay. Highly possible. I'm okay with our choices here. I'm completely fine with mm -hmm. them. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Let's take a break. We're going to come back. We've got Ask Us Anything coming up to wrap up the show. Annie and Elston here on The Fan.
So if you want to get a 97.3, the fan graced Padres City Connect colored poncho, you got to go to that game on April 2nd. Don't have tickets? Come on out to Baja Ricks. Both of our shows will have tickets to give away to April 2nd. Plus, there will be Blue Moon, Coors Light, and Topo Chico specials and breakfast served from 6 to 10 a.m. That's Thursday, March 28th, Baja Ricks Cantina, corner of 6th and L in the gas lamp, brought to you by Blue Moon. Celebrate responsibly. After seeing the turnout yesterday, today, I mean... <laughs> That at, was this morning. This morning at three in the morning. What's it going to be like on an actual day with the sun up? Amazing. Holy cow. You say tonight for the second game. And so does my mom. And she means because it's like at 3 a.m. Right. I say tomorrow. It's tomorrow morning. Which is accurate. I mean, you're right. Yes. But it, she thinks of it like that. Like, no, no. But like you like tonight, like tonight, because it's like into the night. Right. That's why yeah, you're sleeping. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, it's while you're sleeping, or supposedly sleeping. However, I'll probably be dead to the world by 8.30 tonight. <laughs> What's your game plan now? <sighs> the game plan is to tucker myself out. Mm -hmm. So there may be another short power nap when I get home, because I've just been doing 30-minute ones, right? I did a 30-minute nap at 4.40. I did a 30-minute nap at 5.40. Uh, that's it for me since 6 o'clock yesterday morning. Wow. So uh, I'm thinking of another short power nap. Into the afternoon, go to the gym, go for a run. I want to tire myself out, have a nice big dinner, be ready to fall asleep, 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Going to have to probably watch the East Coast Survivor today because I couldn't possibly miss Survivor. But if I watch the 8 o'clock, I have to stay up till 9.30. So maybe watch the East Coast Survivor, good plan. go to bed, mm -hmm. and then alarm hits, 2.45, pop up. Maybe put a little coffee on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A little coffee, a little something, a little water. Mm -hmm. Hydrate and uh, tune in and see if the Padres will keep me awake at 307 Yamamoto versus Musgrove. And I think they will. I think they will. Looking forward to it. Fernando Tatis Jr. did not have a good first game. No. It's game one. Yeah. Throw it away. Honestly. Yeah, I don't. It's hard to like read a lot into that. Can't read anything into yeah. anything. If there's one thing to learn over time about baseball, it's that you're not going to learn anything. Day after day, you're not going to learn anything. So many times you're going to leave the ballpark going, I know something now, and you're just going to be wrong. And I don't mean just you, like you, wrong way listener, <laughs> always coming up with dumb ideas. No, I mean, I'll, I'll put it to myself. How many times? I was walking down the stairwell to get back down to Tony Gwynn Drive after a Padres win some point in the early summer, sometime in you know May, or June, mid-June, and turning to whoever I was at the game with and going, it's just going to be like this the rest of the year. Soto hitting bombs, Xander getting three hits, Tatis throwing guys out and stealing bases, and Ha Sung Kim doing everything, and the team putting up nine, 10, 12 runs, and the pitching being good, and us just cruising to victory. We're going to cruise to so many wins, and then we just didn't because each one of those days was a false signal. As it turned out, all of those games were false signals. The real signal was, was what was not happening month after month after month. I mean, it's what makes it so difficult because you do, you look for trends. Uh, there's, you know, uh, players really, it's I think like 100, 100 plate appearances before you even start to kind of look at what your season's starting to look at, look, right. look like. Uh, so that's typically like the standard and that you're, you're kind of looking for. Um, so we got a long way to go before that, <laughs> but it is hard. I, I, it's so hard not to get, you know, not to go with the, the emotion of the day's game. I totally get that. You can start three for 30, a 100 average, get a hit in your next six at bats and go from 100 to 250. Yeah. It from 30 to 36 at bats. Yeah. So everything changes radically. I'll, I'll give you another example. We were all very, very happy with Jackson Merrill's performance this morning. 
as he had three barrels. He had three hard hit balls. Yeah, he went over three, but he put the ball in play hard three times. Really well done. Fast forward 10 games. And if he's over 29, we're not going to really care, <laughs> care about how many barrels he got. Yeah. So it's, it's just so, so difficult. Satan's blowfish in the chat. I remember the Milwaukee Brewers, I think it was 1987, won their first 13 games, mm -hmm. didn't make the playoffs, started 13 and 0. Third, because 13, I totally get how you start 13 and 0 and you're like, this is going to be a great season. But 13 and 13 games is like a blip. It's like, a drop of water in the ocean of a season. Yeah, you won 13 games in two weeks. Amazing. Maybe you then win 13 games in six weeks. And your yeah. team just slowly drifts, drifts, drifts down to 500 and below 500. So it's it's fun. We get this incredible privilege to be here every day and to talk through it. So we're going to talk through each game. We're going to we're going to break them all down. We're going to look at the composite parts. We're going to talk about the players' performances, but you're just going to hear me say this over and over. You're going to be like, Sh stop saying it, Craig, but you, you just, you have to look at these things dispassionately. You have to look at each of these and sorry, just because I played it, but like as a poker hand, like you, <laughs> you had this hand. It was the hand you wanted. You lost next hand. You don't next hand. You don't just sit there the rest of the night and go, oh, God, I had pocket tens and I couldn't win with them. Like next hand, you got to keep going on. And it's over time that you find out whether you're good or you're bad as a player. And, and the same goes for baseball teams. It's over time that you'll find out where they really stand. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you, you try to watch the trends, but even the trends within six week period of time or two month period of time could be very different from then the following two months or the two months before it. Or so the, the trends are kind of what you're looking for, but then overall at the end of the season, what the trends were, but you're as a team, you're usually looking at it like a third of the season, usually like, but you're, you, you know, you're trying to make adjustments, but not too many adjustments because you want to let things take process and give things a chance to work and give guys a chance to work out of slumps. And you don't want to do anything too rash at the same time. That's like the sweet spot, right? Like you don't, you don't want to do anything too rash, but you don't want to wait too long to pull the trigger. So it's, it's definitely a little fine tuning there. And to answer Brandon's question in the chat, what did the Tigers do in 1984? They started 35 and five. Brandon, they started 35 and five. And that team went on to win the World Series in dominant fashion. So it's not always a false signal. It can be a very real signal. Uh, the 98 Yankees are another example of that. But of course, last year, the Tampa Bay Rays, through I think 70 games, were the runaway best team in Major League Baseball. The Padres are in an interesting spot, too, because they're betting on some guys that they don't have history with. So you're betting on, you, you have to give things a chance to work, right? So um, you're you're either betting or you're you're taking that bet off the table, one way or another. But you, you don't have that with some of these guys in some of these spots that are more unknown or more uncertain. You don't have a track record. You don't have a history to lean on. You don't say, well, we just necessarily keep this guy there. But out of need, they might have to in some situations. But that's going to be the interesting thing I think to watch too with this organization is what how do they let things play out or not, and especially with some of these guys that they don't have the history with such as their veterans. Final break of the show. When we come back, it's time to ask us anything. We'll open up the phone lines for you one more time on this program. 833-288-0973 is the number to use. In fact, if you want to dial in during the break, Braden will screen you up and we'll take you coming right out of the break. It is our catch-all fun call-in segment to wrap up the show. We only have one thing that we ask of you when you do dial us, 833-288-0973. Please ask us a question. Have a question in mind when you call in because the name of the segment is ask us anything coming up next to wrap up Annie and Elston on the fan.
Chris Ello and Matt Scraby coming up next on Gwen and Chris. Of course, it's uh, 5.46 in the morning tomorrow in Seoul, South Korea. So I don't know if Tony Gwynn Jr. is going to join the show today uh, at some point. Maybe he's going to, you know, dial in after breakfast. I think he did that last time. So check it out, though. Gwen and Chris from 2 to 6, the Scraby Chronicles (laughs) from 6 to 7. That's what Chris calls it, so I'm just going to call it the Scraby Chronicles. I think that's kind of funny. Maybe he'll chronicle Chronicles. the match game and his thoughts on that. I, I would love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his desire to improve mm-hmm. as a match game panelist. All right, let's play the bumper. Her name is Annie. His name is Craig. They're joined by Brayden. But who are they really? Never hurts to ask. It's time to ask us anything on Annie and Elston. 833-288-0973 if you want to dial us up. Tim in Miramar has dialed us up. He wants to ask us something. Hi, Tim. Welcome to Ask Us Anything. Hello, folks. How you doing today? Doing well, brother. How about you? All right. Here's my question. You ready? Ready. How many quality at bats did Tatis have in the game? We're defining that as quality at bats. Like you just, know the definition. Okay, the, as the eye test, the quality at bat. Uh, he did not have very many quality at bats yesterday. I would. Well, how many morning. did he have? None. How many did zero? Right. Okay. So now what? We're gonna we're still gonna bat him tomorrow today, right? Uh, you're going to bat him every day, absolutely. But I love when guys talk the talk, but they got to walk the walk, man. And that includes Manny, too. If those guys don't hit, doesn't matter who they have on the team. If the guys are paying the big money to hit and pitch, doesn't matter who's in left field or center field, my friend. I and like I, it, you're, you're good. <laughs> No, I appreciate you, man. Thank you. I mean, listen, it's one game. If, if Toddy's hitting... 175 with no homers at the end of April, even halfway through April. We'll be talking about it. It's Tatis Jr. We're going to talk about everything he does every game. He is a lightning rod. He's the straw that stirs the drink. Yes, I am I am very adamant about the fact that the superstars need to pull their weight this year, but we have to give them more time to do that. Uh, the chat is telling me that it's officially a five-pitch at bat, a quality at bat. Yeah, I've well, never heard that. It's five or six. Usually. Five or six it depends. Yeah, that's. I mean, that makes sense. If you see pitches, it's yeah. quality AB. Yeah. I mean, you're running a pitch counts. There's, there's multiple. I think there's like six different vers- like ways to get a quality at bat. One of them is seeing pitches. Well, Toddy didn't, and we talked about that in a previous segment. How- but thank you for your. It wasn't really a question, but it was a. Well, no, it was. It a was question. a question. Yeah, thank it was you a for question. your question. It was just yes. more of like a math problem type yeah. question, like. <laughs> Here's the question. There is an answer. <laughs> Please see if you can get it right. The answer is zero. Uh, how about Alex in Cardiff? Hi, Alex. Welcome to Ask Us Anything. Alex. He, he, goes, he, he, goes, he's got, he got scared off. He was like, I, I cannot follow up. Enough. Right. I don't. Yeah. They don't All want right. it bad enough. Here we go. Let's reach in. Card. Card. Card time. Uh, cut the deck. And deal what tv show was canceled way too soon wow mind hunter i'm just gonna go with your answer that's a great answer bang saved by the bell really i don't know (laughs) see he says i don't know netflix ball i know ball (laughs) mind hunter is a great show what movie is so bad it's actually fun to watch napoleon dynamite oh i don't think it's bad though i think it's good I like. I really like the Big Lebowski, but that's a kind of a dumb movie. It's hilarious. Though. I love the Big Lebowski. Don't you say I'm, anything bad about it. I'm the dude. The dude abides. Nobody. It was like the, the Zoltan one, or like the the Zoolander. No. Yeah. Okay. I'll go with Zoolander. But Zoolander's a good movie. That's I, true. Yeah. Zoltan. I don't know. I'm on. I'm on. Are you thinking of like the the, the guy movie. from like the from Big the Reads the card. Is that guy's name Zoltan or something that. like that? Don't, put, mess the the, uh, don't mess with the Zoltan. Don't mess with Zoltan. Yeah, like remember the movie yeah. Big with uh, Tom Hanks, where don't he like wish wish he could be that. older. I think it was Zoltan was like the the guy that granted in the wish in the arcade it. game. Dude, where's my car? Is a great answer. Dude, where's my car? Is a very very funny movie. 
Did you ever watch Dude, Where's My Car? No, I, I have seen, seen that. Maybe yeah. favorite scene. Dude, where's your car? Where's my car, dude? Where's your car, dude? Dude, where's my car? Where's your car, dude? It's actually is that the whole movie. Pretty much, okay. but it's very funny. It is, yeah. It's very funny. Oh, I switched. These light blue ones are like light media stuff. Here's Ooh. dark blue. Ah. Wow. Oh. What do you wish didn't bother you so much? People. I'm just kidding. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, what did I wish didn't bother me so much? Um, people doing dumb things. Yeah, that like bothers I, me. I would it should say never like, bother me. It didn't bother but me it so does. much. Um, yeah, I think like just just um. <laughs> oh, how about like rude people? <laughs> rude people. Although I, get, I think rude people should bother me. Why right? would Why would you not want to yeah. be bothered by a rude person? People doing dumb things around me. Anonymous criticism. That'll be my answer. It's good. Anonymous yeah, criticism. It should never bother you ever. Well, it's but something it that we right. And and you know, in this job, it's something that you actually that you experience. Of you course. Have to deal with it. You experience All anonymous time. criticism. And there's been more of it in the last two months. And believe me, we love everyone who is listening to the show and even the folks who've been like, eh, you know, I tune in, I, I don't know, it's okay, whatever. That's fine. But like the guy who goes out of their way, like, I'd like to make a point of letting you know I don't like you and think you do a good job. That shouldn't matter to me at all. And I think soon it won't. But that's why I answer, why do I wish it doesn't bother me so much? I like that Tyler Ellison said, opening day overreactions. Good one. <laughs> that's for sure. Oh. Good one. <laughs> <laughs> the number of quality at bats a player has one game into the season. That's... Doesn't bother me as much as it as it could. Yeah, waking up to a hundred text messages overreacting about the Padres at three in the morning. Yeah, that's. What's something that always makes you cry? Always. I cry at like things that are nice. Something that always makes me cry is like, like a nice act, like someone helping out an old person, or like someone saving a little puppy, or like I cry at all that stuff. When. Uh... Myself, people I love, or you know, friends, family achieve something very, very great. I love that. Like insane achievements. Mm -hmm. A heartfelt rendition of the anthem. Oh, that's nice. As Jack Crona would say, mm -hmm. we won the anthem. <laughs> Good start to the game. We won the anthem. <laughs> we won the anthem. Hey, I think we won't ask us anything today. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks to all the callers who checked in. We'll be back with another game to chew on tomorrow. Annie and Elston. Bye.